Ladies and gentlemen, we are now to begin the symposium Territory and Maritime Issues in East Asia and Their Origins, co-hosted by Japan Institute of International Affairs, Toshisha University Center for Study of South China Sea, and Faculty of Law, Toshisha University. I doubt that on behalf of the organizers, uh, Mr. Yasunori Nakayama, Director General uh, Acting of JIIA, gives us opening remarks. Mr. Nakayama, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this happens to be a Saturday, and this is a day of a gorgeous weather outside, but thank you very much indeed in choosing to attend our symposium, uh, Territory and Maritime Issues in East Asia and Their Origins. Uh, this symposium is uh, co-hosted by Doshi University Center for the Study of South China Sea, Faculty of Law, Doshi University, and our institute, the JIIA. At our institute, uh, in uh, 2017, we started a program concerning issues of territory, sovereignty, and history. And in this program, we have organized various uh, research projects and symposia. And here we uh, are going to deal with an issue of territory and maritime issues in East Asia and the origins in this symposium. As you know, East Asia uh, is uh, becoming increasingly important in the global economy. At the same time, uh, this is the region where uh, there are many territorial or maritime uh, issues still unresolved. So, in view of uh, the coexistence of such opportunities and risks, uh, Japan uh, has announced uh, uh, the strategy of India and Pacific free and open, and in that regard, we seek to establish and keep a freedom of our navigation and the full-fledged establishment of free trade, as well as the importance of the rule of law. For various uh, disputes in the region, uh, we must seek for a peaceful resolution based upon international law, uh, rejecting uh, any change to the status quo with the use of force. Uh, in this symposium, we have uh, invited experts of different fields, history, international law, and international politics. And uh, we are here to have discussion on the origin of territorial and maritime issues, and we hope that this will lead us to consider ways uh, to uh, seek the establishment of the rule of law and the peace and economic prosperity in East Asia. As a special as a keynote speaker, we are so honored to have Mr. Paul Reichler, uh, who won a, a, a award in favor of the Philippines in 2016 in South China Sea uh, Arbitration Tribunal. And uh, he is going to enlighten us of uh, the award and also development uh, in South China Sea and the impact of this uh, arbitral award on other territorial and maritime issues in East Asia and will set the stage for uh, the subsequent discussion which will take place today. Last but not least, I'd like to take this opportunity to express my heartfelt thanks to uh, Mr. Paul Reichler and uh, uh, University of, uh, of Doshisha, uh, especially Professor Ryo Asano, Director of uh, uh, Doshisha University Center for South uh, China Sea Study. I uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to, first of all, express my gratitude and deepest appreciation uh, to uh, JIIA and Doshisha University, Professor Asano, and uh, Mr. Nakayama in particular, for bestowing upon me the honor of uh, inviting me to be here with you. Uh, I, I'm humbled uh, to be 
the person giving the keynote speech in the presence of so many, so many outstanding scholars, uh, any one of whom uh, would probably be a more fitting uh, keynote speaker than myself. So I, I uh, am, am grateful for that. In fact, I feel like I'm, uh, I'm walking down the philosopher's walk with all of the philosophers here in the room. Uh, so I, I, I'm in wonderful company. Um, the topic uh, that I have been asked to speak about is the South China Sea arbitration and beyond. Uh, China's approach to the law of the sea. And I will come to that in a moment. Uh, I was asked uh, by the organizers uh, before I address the, the main topic if I would make a few remarks about the International Court of Justice's recent advisory opinion issued on the 25th of February, last Monday, in the case involving the Chagos Archipelago. I had the honor of being present uh, during the reading of that advisory opinion as one of the counsel to Mauritius. Um, I had argued the case before the court uh, in September last year and have had the privilege of arguing before, among others, Judge Iwasawa. Uh, I have now uh, uh, had the honor of arguing before Judge Oda, Judge Owada, and Judge Iwasawa. Um, I also argued alongside uh, one of your colleagues, Professor Shotaro Hamamoto of Kyoto University, who uh, appeared as counsel for an advocate for Botswana and made an absolutely superb argument in support of Mauritius's position. Briefly, the case involved uh, the uh, issue of decolonization of Mauritius. In 1965, prior to the granting of independence of Mauritius by the British, uh, the British themselves divided the colony of Mauritius, keeping for themselves a portion of that colony, specifically the Chagos Archipelago, and creating a new colony, which they called the British Indian Ocean Territories. They did that for the purpose of establishing a military base, military facilities, which were accomplished by virtue of leasing that territory to the United States. In 1968, Mauritius was granted independence, but without the Chagos Archipelago. As a sovereign state, Mauritius never stopped demanding the return of that piece of its territory, the Chagos Archipelago, which was severed from it by the British prior to the granting of independence. Because uh, the British uh, have reservations to their acceptance of ICJ jurisdiction. It was not possible for Mauritius to bring a contentious case against the United Kingdom. However, after many years of presenting the issue before the General Assembly of the United Nations, in 2017, the General Assembly adopted a resolution by an overwhelming vote to uh, submit the matter to the International Court of Justice in a request for an advisory opinion. And specifically, the General Assembly asked the court to answer two questions. One, given that the Chagos Archipelago was severed from Mauritius prior to independence and remained under British rule, was the decolonization of Mauritius ever lawfully completed? And two, what are the consequences, the legal consequences today, of the continued colonial administration of the Chagos Archipelago? The court answered both questions, 
Uh, and because these were advisory proceedings, every state that, was, that is a member of the United Nations had an opportunity to participate uh, if they chose to do so. Some 30 states did, either through written submissions or at the oral hearings. The vast majority uh, spoke in support of Mauritius's position. And the court on Monday issued its advisory opinion in which it answered both of the questions put to it by the General Assembly. In response to the first question, the court decided that the decolonization of Mauritius was not lawfully completed. That is, that it was unlawful in 1965 for the British to dismember the colonial territory and to establish a new territory because as of 196, a, a new uh, colony, I'm sorry, because as of 1965, international law had already crystallized into a rule, a customary rule, requiring the decolonization of subject peoples, of non-self-governing peoples, in accordance with the freely exercised self-determination of those peoples. And that the United States, the United Nations, excuse me, the, I'm sorry, the United Kingdom, it's the jet lag, I apologize. <laughs> I just arrived yesterday. Uh, it, it, the United Kingdom had failed to respect uh, the right of self-determination of the people of Mauritius. And in particular, uh, in establishing the colony and the military base, it forcibly removed the native population of these islands. Uh, and uh, removed these people against their will, um, uh, forcing them to leave their possessions behind, and deposited them in Mauritius and the Seychelles. It was, a, uh, as the court found, a, a horrendous violation of their human rights. So in dismembering Mauritius bef uh, on the the verge of its independence, and not granting independence to the entire colony, the UK was found not to have lawfully uh, completed the decolonization of Mauritius. In response to the second question, the court decided that the continued colonial, the ongoing colonial administration is an internationally unlawful act, and it is, a con it is continuing in nature as long as the United Kingdom uh, retains its administration over the Chagos Archipelago, which duly uh, forms part of Mauritius. And uh, the court further opined that in order to bring itself into compliance with its international legal obligations, the United Kingdom must end its colonial administration of the Chagos Archipelago as rapidly as possible. The court also said that because self-determination and uh, decolonization are uh, principles so fundamental to international law that they have erga omnis application that other states, members of the United Nations, uh, must cooperate uh, in the um, decolonization of Mauritius and not contribute to or support the continued colonial administration by the British. Now this is an advisory opinion, so it is not technically legally binding as a judgment of the court would be. However, it is an authoritative and final determination of the legal issues and the legal obligations. Uh, and uh, it is hoped that the British, who have always uh, professed and uh, in many ways honored that profession, uh, their commitment to the rule of law and international relations, uh, it is hoped that uh, they will uh, comply with what the court said 
they should do. Mauritius, meanwhile, will return to the United Nations General Assembly, the court having answered the General Assembly's questions for uh, further resolution implementing the, the court's opinion. Um, if there are any questions at, at, uh, later on, I'm, I'm happy to discuss them. So with that, I would like to uh, return to my topic, the South China Sea arbitration and beyond, and particularly China's approach to the, to the law of the sea. Now, I would, uh, by the way, may I ask the interpreters if I'm speaking at an appropriate pace? I'm not going too fast for you. I've learned through many years of arguing in the International Court of Justice that it doesn't help you if you speak too fast, because if the interpreters can't keep up with you, you're just talking to yourself. Uh, so um, I'll keep an eye on you, and please give me a signal if I, if I start going too fast. Um, the, uh, I, uh, the, um, uh, the award is uh, over 400 pages, so naturally I will speak very briefly and, and summarize. Um, I did give a presentation on the award in some detail before uh, JIIA two years ago, and my, my uh, presentation is in one of the um, uh, publications. Uh, by JIIA of that period. So if anybody uh, is interested, uh, you can, you can uh, uh, refer to that. But for today, let me say that while there were many issues in the case, there are two that stand out above the others. The first was China's claim uh, based on its so-called nine-dash line to not only sovereign rights, but actually sovereignty over all of the waters of the South China Sea within the contours of this nine-dash line. Uh, if you've seen it uh, depicted, you would know how exaggerated a claim this is. The South China Sea is shaped like a bucket with the top being the mainland coast of southern China. The nine-dash line is like the tongue of a cow, which reaches down from the top of the bucket almost entirely to the bottom. And it extends more than 600 miles from the Chinese mainland coast. Uh, and it comes very close uh, to the Philippines, to uh, Malaysia, Brunei, Indonesia, and in the uh, west to Vietnam. Uh, it, it comes within 35 to 50 miles of their coasts, thus depriving all of these states of the vast majority of their entitlements, their 200-mile entitlements, under the Law of the Sea Convention. Now, um, China makes this claim based on its alleged historic rights. And it claims that its, its historic rights supersede those of its neighbors under UNCLOS. Now, what the tribunal decided uh, is that this is nonsense. It's an exaggerated claim which has no basis in international law. The tribunal decided this unanimously. Uh, it held that when the, when the state's parties adopted UNCLOS, the Law of the Sea Convention, in 1982, they specifically rejected the idea that any previously claimed historic rights in areas beyond the 12-mile territorial sea would exist. The new regimes for the exclusive economic zone and continental shelf out to 200 miles, that is beyond the 12-mile territorial sea, were uh, an agreement uh, by the state's parties that replaced 
any previously existing claims based on historic or economic rights. And thus, China could not lawfully claim to have historic rights that went beyond those that, to which it itself was entitled under UNCLOS. Court, the tribunal further found, also unanimously, that even under general international law principles, China could not make a credible claim of historic rights. Under general international law, a claim of historic rights must be based on the continuous administration under claim of title over a long period of time and with the acquiescence of third states. And there was no evidence to support China's claims in this regard in the South China Sea. Indeed, up until uh, the end of World War II, China had never made any claim to any of the sea south of the Paracel Islands, which are far to the north uh, in the, uh, in the uh, South China Sea. Indeed, they hadn't made claims to the sea, they had made claims to those islands. Uh, there were periods lasting centuries when China itself, uh, the, the emperors, forbade any kind of commerce, uh, any kind of Chinese commerce uh, in the South China Sea as part of an effort to close China off uh, from uh, the influences of the then European powers. So the idea of any continuous administration under claim of title over a prolonged period of time, let alone with acquiescence of neighboring states, just had no evidence whatsoever to support it. So on this issue, um, the, um, the tribunal ruled that the nine-dash line claim was unlawful. There was no basis for it. The other major issue decided uh, by the tribunal uh, which I will uh, only touch on very briefly because of time, and I do want to allow time for discussion and, and questions, had to do with the entitlements, the maritime entitlements of islands, and particularly the Spratly Islands. It, ha it was China's position that, the, that, the, that it was sovereign over all of the Spratly Islands, and that they constituted an archipelago, and thus, straight lines could be drawn connecting the outermost features from which uh, maritime entitlements uh, up to 200 miles would extend. The tribunal rejected that uh, thesis uh, correctly. First, it decided it did not need to determine who had sovereignty over these disputed islands because maritime entitlements uh, do not depend on who is sovereign. They depend on the nature of the particular insular feature. It also found, uh, quite rightly, that under UNCLOS, uh, it was impossible to claim archipelagic status for a group of uh, outer islands because uh, UNCLOS substituted for the rule of customary international law, a new um, paradigm for archipelagic status. And it defines how and under what circumstances a state can consider itself an archipelagic state. And it's very clear that China does not qualify under, under UNCLOS. Uh, the tribunal went on to find further that these insular features uh, were not capable of sustaining human habitation or economic life on their own, and therefore they generated no more than a 12-mile entitlement, regardless of who is sovereign. Now, the significance of this for the, these rulings for the Philippines and for the other states in the regions was this, that China was limited in its entitlements to a 200-mile exclusive economic zone and continental shelf from its mainland coast. And even if it was sovereign over any islands in the Spratlys, 
they generated no more than a 12 mile entitlement. When one uh, overlays the picture of China's entitlements on the entitlements, the 200 mile entitlements from the coasts of Philippines, Malaysia, um, Indonesia, and Vietnam in particular, one finds that, uh, that China, in fact, does not overlap uh, much of the entitlements of the other states. That is, all of the other states would get to enjoy almost the entirety of their 200-mile entitlements under UNCLOS. Now, China has rejected, formally rejected the award. As you all know, it decided not to participate in the proceedings, uh, and it tried throughout to discredit the arbitration, discredit the proceedings, and it has um, denounced the award. But significantly, it has, while it has denounced the award, it has not withdrawn from UNCLOS, the convention, and indeed, it has tried to defend its positions by arguing that they are consistent with UNCLOS, that the tribunal made a wrong interpretation of the treaty, but that uh, China's position itself is consistent with UNCLOS. I think this is, this is very significant for reasons that I will come to. For instance, on historic rights, they argue that the convention does not replace historic rights established under general international law with the regime of the exclusive economic zone and continental shelf, but they exist side by side. I think China is probably the only state in the world that makes this argument, and it was rejected by the tribunal unanimously. But I think it is significant that China tries to cloak its position uh, within the confines of international law and uh, UNCLOS in particular. Um, on islands, uh, again, China says that, uh, that the Spratleys represent an outlying archipelago of China, uh, and it, the, the archipelagic status is well-founded under general international law. It says the regime of continental states outlying archipelagos is well established. Well, again, this is entirely inconsistent with UNCLOS and the regime for archipelagic states. But it is interesting that China argues that this is consistent with UNCLOS. I, I think any expert on uh, on the convention and on the law of the sea would disagree with China's position. But again, it is not insignificant that China is attempting to defend itself as behaving consistently with international law and with the convention in particular. Um, let me touch upon what has happened uh, between China and the Philippines since uh, the publication of the award in July of 2016. Well, first, as you know, there was a change in government of the Philippines at about that time, and they adopted a different policy toward, toward China. Um, they made a decision that they would not, indeed they could not, abandon the award and the benefits that they obtained under the award but they decided not to insist on compliance uh, directly to the Chinese. Uh, they have adopted a policy of, of friendliness toward China, and they have reaped uh, massive Chinese investment and increased trade in return. Also, the Chinese have allowed Philippine fishermen to return to fish and exercise their fishing rights around Scarborough Shoal, which was one of the important issues to the Philippines in the case. In that sense, China is complying with one of its obligations under the award. And in regard to the, uh, the maritime area that lies between 
uh, the Spratly Islands and the Philippine coast at Palawan, an area called Reed Bank, which is considered to be uh, likely to have huge uh, petroleum resources in the continental shelf, um, where China had previously uh, used force to keep the Philippines from uh, exploring uh, for oil in this area, which is which is 100 miles off the Philippine coast, so plainly within the Philippine um, continental shelf and exclusive economic zone. But China has approached the Philippines about joint development, uh, and the states are in discussion about that. And in this way, it may very well be that the Philippines gets to enjoy the resources of its continental shelf uh, in collaboration with China. A word or two on the attitudes and actions of other South China Sea coastal states uh, after the issuance of the award. Of course, the award is binding only between China and the Philippines. However, the principles that were established by the uh, tribunal, that is the rejection of the lawfulness of the nine-dash line, is, is as beneficial to Vietnam and Malaysia and Indonesia as it is to the Philippines. But something to take note of is that uh, since the war, China has avoided confrontations with the other South China Sea states. It has not engaged in any drilling or exploration for oil within 200 miles of their coasts, as it had started to do off the coast of Vietnam uh, before the arbitral award. And nor has it challenged their possession of uh, the islands that they already possess, these other states, the Philippines and, and uh, uh, Vietnam in particular, in, in the South China Sea, that is the Spratleys. Um, to be sure, China has uh, consolidated its hold on the eight or so islands in this group that it has uh, already possessed. It's built military facilities on them with some regard as a threat. But it, it has not attempted to dispossess Vietnam, or Malaysia, or the Philippines of any of the islands that they, uh, that they hold. So China has been cautious, not aggressive, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other states uh, in the wake of the arbitral award. Looking at the interests of the other states, of course, Vietnam and Indonesia in particular have interests similar to those of the Philippines. And they have made very clear and public their denunciation, their refusal to accept the nine-dash line and China's exaggerated claims. Similarly, they reject China's claims of exaggerated entitlements from islands. But they have not been able to engage in any action uh, largely because they have acted individually rather than collectively. Um, it's very difficult for them to act through ASEAN because ASEAN includes certain states that are very loyal to China. And, uh, um, and, and ASEAN only acts by consensus. Um, and China has uh, skillfully insisted on dealing with each of these states on a bilateral basis. Whereas uh, if the South China Sea states, the major South China Sea states, are to achieve any uh, assurance to themselves of their rights, it's quite clear they will have to act collectively, that there's strength in numbers, and that they can bring greater pressure on China to accommodate their lawful and legitimate interests if they act together. And I, I'm referring particularly to uh, Vietnam and Indonesia and the Philippines. Um, and and uh, uh, it, it will take collective action by those three at least uh, uh, before um, China uh, comes around uh, to recognizing the rights that the arbitral tribunal made clear that they, that they have. Now... I, I thought it, in the few minutes that I have left, I would uh, leave the South China Sea and uh, talk about um, uh, 
China's neighbors to the east uh, by way of a parallel and see if there are some uh, um, uh, common threads here. In regard to uh, China's uh, 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 maritime relationship uh, with South Korea, um, of course they share a boundary which is yet to be established in the Yellow Sea. Um, there are uh, incipient uh, negotiations. One interesting thing here is that China's approach has been that before the parties can agree on a maritime boundary, they should agree on the equitable principles that uh, will govern uh, the formation of the boundary. Now, of course, uh, the ICJ, ITLOS, Annex 7 arbitral tribunals have all adopted uh, an approach, a methodology, for achieving exactly that, an equitable boundary. In fact, uh, the convention itself says that the boundary in the uh, exclusive economic zone and continental shelf should be based on equity. Um, and that is the so-called three-stage process. First, drawing an equidistance line or a median line, then uh, assessing whether there are relevant geographic circumstances which uh, make the equidistance line inequitable, in which case you would make an adjustment to it, and, and then you would test for the proportionality or lack of proportionality of the final line. Um, but uh, China takes its own approach, and in particular, in the delimitation of the continental shelf, they have come up with their own unique uh, formulation that instead of a median line, that the South Koreans should recognize that the vast majority of the seabed in the Yellow Sea, the sediments, come from China. And because they come from Chinese rivers, that the vast majority of the continental shelf uh, should uh, belong to China. Uh, as, now, I cannot, uh, I don't want to belittle that argument too much because we actually made it uh, on behalf of Bangladesh in before ITLOS. Um, there had, uh, this was a case between Bangladesh and Myanmar and it was the first time a court or tribunal had ever been called upon to delimit beyond 200 miles. So coastal configuration was not relevant. It was more geology and geomorphology of the seabed. And um, one of the arguments that we made on behalf of Bangladesh was that the vast majority of the seabed, that is the shelf beyond 200 miles, was formed by these enormous river systems, the Ganges and the Brahmaputra, that were washing down from Bangladesh and India. And there were no major rivers from Myanmar feeding into the, into the seabed in the, in the Bay of Bengal. Um, we thought it was worth a try. It was unanimously rejected um, and um, probably uh, for good reason. Um, the, the, the court was uninterested in where the sediments came from. The only issue was whether the sediment was there, whether there was uh, a shelf and whether there was a pertinence by the coastal state. And so uh, China makes an argument in the Yellow Sea that has been rejected by the only court uh, to consider it. Um, very briefly, and uh, I, I, uh, uh, let me talk about uh, China's claims, maritime claims vis-a-vis -vis Japan. Um, China, uh, at least publicly, has rejected the, the, the idea that the boundary is formed in, in the East China Sea is formed by the median line. Um, uh, Japan, uh, by, by its law, uh, claims that, that the boundary, of course, shall be determined by agreement, but in the absence of a, a agreement, essentially it adopts the median line or equidistance as a basis of determining the boundary, which is very consistent with UNCLOS. Uh, China rejects that, uh, and they've made that clear in public statements at least since 2015. 
And let me read from what their Ministry of Foreign Affairs wrote in 2015. China claims a 200-mile exclusive economic zone and China's continental shelf in the East China Sea prolongs naturally to the Okinawa Trough. Now, um, this, of course, is a very serious issue for Japan. Um, of course, if China claim, in terms of the EEZ, that doesn't depend on the seabed. It's, it's distinct from the continental shelf. They claim a 200-mile EEZ. Japan claims a 200-mile EEZ. Uh, the distance is less than 400 miles. So one would think that the overlap uh, would be settled by means of a median line, despite what, what, uh, what China says. Certainly that is what UNCLOS would, would the, the convention would, would, uh, would provide and any international court or tribunal would, would decide. But the issue of the continental shelf is a very interesting one. It's another example of China um, ostensibly basing a claim on UNCLOS. That is, they don't say, we don't care what's in the convention. They say, uh, they make an argument that they try to base on, root in the convention, just as some of these other arguments we've seen about, uh, about human rights. And they take a look at Article uh, 76 one of the convention, uh, which provides uh, two bases for claiming a, a, a continental shelf. One is the 200-mile legal entitlement, and then natural prolongation. Uh, and they say there is a natural prolongation of the, of the shelf off of China's coast that extends to the Okinawa Trough, which is very, very close to Japan, as you know better than I. Um, so the question is, of course, is how would you delimit the continental shelf in the East China Sea? Would you um, uh, uh, take the 200-mile claims, the overlap, draw a median line, which I believe is Japan's position, and I believe that's, that's the correct position, or would you uh, 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 compare China's claim to the Okinawa shelf, to the Okinawa trough, with Japan's median line, 200 mile claim, and then put a median line between the two of those, which of course would put the, the boundary much closer to Japan than to China. Uh, this, this is an issue which is, uh, China's claim I think is extreme, but it is not entirely implausible, because if you uh, read Article 76.1, which talks about both um, a, a continental shelf limit based on natural prolongation and a legal limit of 200 miles, the language does not expressly say that the 200 mile limit prevails over the natural prolongation claim. Now, I, uh, I believe that Japan has the much better argument here, but this is another example of China uh, uh, making its own interpretation of UNCLOS and contending that it is um, in compliance with, that it respects the rule of law and particularly UNCLOS. Now, just if I may just conclude in a couple of minutes with, with these observations on China's stated commitment to UNCLOS and the rule of law. I do think, first of all, we must recognize China remains a party to UNCLOS and it continues to state that it is committed to UNCLOS. I think it's important uh, for international law and international relations that China does not renounce or reject the convention uh, and, and that it, it claims uh, to, to, to be in compliance. I think this may be an important starting point for thinking about solutions to some of these problems. Now, the problem exists, I think, uh, certainly from Japan's perspective, but it would be a perspective that I share, that China has adopted some extremely uh, self-serving and, and almost, almost implausible interpretations of UNCLOS. So, 
what do you do? Um, China, now, as we see, they reject arbitration. Um, they won't participate. It's clear they won't participate. They would have to have a dramatic change in policy view to participate. So the arbitration provisions of the, of the convention uh, really aren't helpful for those states, whether it's Japan or Korea or the states along the South China Sea. Um, um, I mean, it, 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 might, it, it might be possible to instigate an arbitration and to get a, an award for what it's worth, an interpretation and a rejection of China's view, but knowing in advance that China won't participate and will probably refuse to accept it uh, diminishes the value of such an approach. So what can be done? Well, the convention also provides for compulsory mediation or compulsory conciliation, if you will. Um, now, this is an approach that actually worked between Timor-Leste and Australia, the only time it's been ever invoked, and it produced an agreement. Um, is it possible that China would accept compulsory conciliation uh, if it were instigated by uh, Vietnam, for example, or Indonesia? Um, well, it might not be very likely, I don't know, but conciliation is not arbitration. And conciliation is voluntary. The result is a recommendation. It's not a binding uh, judgment. So it, at least it's something to think about. And if the current position of China is to reject all forms of third party solution, then maybe that policy will soften o over time, um, at least in regard to conciliation as opposed to arbitration. Another possibility, and uh, of course you'll forgive me if I have advisory opinion on the brain, um, uh, but um, it, it now appears more attractive than it did last week. But uh, seriously though, um, there is the possibility, for example, of going to ITLOS and seeking an advisory opinion, which is not a contentious proceeding and would not require China's um, agreement. But an advisory opinion by the 21 uh, member ITLOS, which includes a Chinese judge, very distinguished a Chinese judge, by the way, Judge Gao, and uh, raising the question of do historic rights or his claims of historic rights survive the convention and the regime of the EEZ and the continental shelf? Is it possible for a continental state that has a, a few offshore islands to claim that it is an archipelagic state on, on, under UNCLOS. Um, these are questions uh, very suitable for an advisory opinion, an authoritative statement on the law, not by five arbitrators, although I don't want to diminish the importance of the arbitral tribunal in the South China. These are five of the world's best experts on law of the sea and, and men of impeccable integrity. But 21 member UNCLOS, uh, that would be an advisory opinion that would be difficult for, for China to reject. Or on the question of the continental shelf, um, does a claim uh, between states that are separated by less than 400 miles, uh, can a state uh, uh, get beyond the median line based on an argument of geology. That is, the, uh, that the, they can extend uh, um, uh, all the way to the Okinawa Trough based on geology, even though uh, Japan has a 200 mile entitlement, as do they, and the proper solution would be a median line. This is an issue that affects other states around the world too. In fact, it's part of the litigation before the ICJ now between Nicaragua and Colombia. But um, with that, I think it's, uh, I've gone a little beyond my time. I, I hope you don't mind, but I, I think this is an appropriate place for me to stop and, and welcome 
comments from my friend Professor Sakamoto, and then any questions that that you might have. I love questions and answers, so I ho I hope you will uh, have have some questions for me. Thank you very much. Mr. Uh, Reichler, thank you very much uh, for giving us a very convincing uh, presentation based on your ample experience. Next, uh, we would like to hear the comment uh, from uh, Professor Shigeki Sakamoto. Professor Sakamoto, please. Uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, I'm Shigeki Sakamoto, Professor of Doshio University. Uh, thank you very much for your excellent and insightful uh, presentation. As Mr. Reichler uh, has rightly pointed out in his paper in the journal by the DIAA, UNCRAS is a very special convention. It was received by the international community as a constitution of the ocean. It has been one of the most uh, successful treaties uh, in the history of international law. UNCRUS is one of the most complex international treaties that have ever been negotiated. While the convention confirmed many provisions of customary international law codified in the 1958 Geneva Conventions. Its main achievement was the progressive development of international law, like the declaration of the area and mineral resources as common heritage of mankind and establishment of uh, 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 the mineral resource uh, establishment international regime governing activities of exploration for and exploitation of the mineral resources of the area and introduction of EEZ and the, also the definition the, of the regime of island and so on. The contribution of anchors to the rule of law may be seen from a substantial and from a procedural point of view. Substantially, anchors try to deal comprehensively with all aspects of the law of the sea. Its provision are drafted so as to encompass in many cases even new program like uh, 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 bank link. Of course, there are limits to the comprehensiveness of anchors as it now stands. Like, uh, there are some kind of challenge which cannot be resolved through interpretation of anchors, like the question of the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity beyond areas of national jurisdiction, so-called BBMJ. Now, right now, it's under discussion of the intergovernmental conference in the United Nations. Procedurally, the main contribution of ANCROS to the rule of law consists in the rules establishing compulsory judicial or arbitral settlement of dispute. The convention provides for a mechanism in the form of compulsory procedure entailing binding decision, which aims at ensuring compliance with the provision, provision of the convention. As a matter of fact, ANCRAS contains many ambiguous provisions as a result of 
compromise reached among states in order to reconcile their conflicting interest and uh, differing view. Many provisions were left for the future development through the interpretation or application of UNCRAS. International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea and Arbitration and Annex 7 of UNCRAS have been clarifying the provision of UNCRAS by delivering a decision and a rules in contentious case, not to generate fragmentation of international law. As Professor Oxman pointed out, the coexistence of various judicial voices like uh, International Court of Justice, ETROS, oral arbitration, improved the growth of international law and the settlement of dispute. For example, the award of South China Sea arbitration is now very, very important for the interpretation of Article 121 defining the regime of island. On January 2013, the Philippines submitted its dispute with China over the Spratly Island to arbitration under Annex 7 of UNCLOS. Prior to this action, on August 2006, China lodged a declaration with the Secretary General of the United Nations stating that it would excludes the dispute stipulated in subparagraph A, B, and C, paragraph 1, article 298 of UNCRAS, from compulsory conflict resolution procedure. The Philippine argued that China is claiming sovereign rights and uh, jurisdiction over all waters within the Nine Dash Line to bypass jurisdiction, jurisdiction restriction, even though it is only allowed to claim rights and jurisdiction over waters measured from land, including island. It has been two years and half now since arbitral tribunal ruled that Nine Dash Rhine asserted by China in the South China Sea is in violation of ANCRAS on July 2016. During this time, China has made numerous political, military, and legal attempts to negate the effects of arbitral award. Immediately after the ruling on September 2016, China and Russia held a joint military exercise off the coast of Gantong province in the South China Sea. Despite the Beijing's claim that construction of artificial islands in the South China Sea is for peaceful purposes, but mischief leaf and fiery cross were equipped with jammer system with exclusively military application in April 2018. China moved quickly to repudiate the tribunal ruling ahead of uh, ASEAN Foreign Minister's meeting. Chinese Foreign Minister traveled to Laos 
on July 24, 2016, to meet with the Foreign Minister of Singapore, Brunei, Myanmar, and Cambodia individually. In an effect, in an effort to divide ASEAN. Cambodia was promised more than $500 million in grant aid over the next three years, which was enough to convince Prime Minister Hun Sen to assert that Cambodia does not support the arbitral award. The Hanzu summit communicated from the G20 held in Hanzu on September 2016 makes no reference to the South China Sea Arbitration Award. At the same summit, only the United States and Japan mentioned South China Sea ruling. Even the Philippines make no reference. On the other hand, Russia stated that it supported China in rebuffing the ruling. Shortly afterward, during our October 2016 visit, the President Duterte concluded an agreement with China on 13 points covering everything from uh, uh, tourism to agriculture. This was accompanied by a total of 24 billion dollars in economic cooperation. Duterte did say in a political speech on July 25, 2016 that the Philippines strongly affirm and respect the arbitration tribunal's award. Yet, it is hard to escape the conclusion that situation is moving in the opposite direction. The dispute in the South China Sea are more than bilateral conflicts. They are an issue that now involves entire region. The approval of Chinese 9 dash line claim, which would turn other countries' EEZ into China's own waters, simply reflects the commitment of the international community to the reign of force. After all, the Philippine, which was plaintiff in the case, and together with the defendant China, is obliged to implement the decision in its capacity as litigant from viewpoint of international law. On June 26, 2016, immediately before the South China Sea Arbiter Award, China and Russia issued the Declaration of the Russian Federation and People's Republic of China on the promotion of, of international law. The Declaration contained the passage, the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China reaffirm the principle of peaceful settlement of dispute. Despite this, China continues to disregard the arbitral award. 
the reason can be found in that they express their firm conviction that states shall resolve their dispute through dispute settlement means and mechanism that they have agreed upon. The Philippines unilateral application falls outside this principle of peaceful settlement of dispute. Moreover, in 2018, an article of more than 540 pages titled The South China Sea Arbitration Awards, a critical study, were published in the name of the Chinese Society of International Law in the Chinese Journal of International Law. It offered extensive criticism of the award and called for it to be invalidated. However, as a party to UNCLOS, China must acknowledge that decision is binding in accordance with Article 296. The international community uh, must not consent to China disregarding a binding decision, but should continue its effort to turn the South China Sea into peaceful sea where UNCLOS applies. Today, distinguished practitioner Mr. Lycro, in his excellent paper, He referred that, quote, we may have an imperfect international legal order, but it's far better than having no rule-based system at all. The response to the international legal order should be to continue working, so make the system better and stronger, and the rules more universally enforceable. There is a long way to go, but since the World War II, great progress has been made, and there is no reason to give up efforts to make all states, including most powerful states like China, take legal accountability for their breaches of the applicable rule, unquote. We should take this word to heart. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Sakamoto. Well, it actually, um, it is time to end this particular part of the program, but this has been a great discussion from the two experts, so we would like to open the floor for any questions or comments. Uh, please uh, raise your hand and uh, please state your name and organizational affiliation before you make a question or comment. No question or comment at this point in time. Uh, my name is Harada with the uh, Defense uh, Research Institute. Thank you very much for a very enlightening uh, talk. I have a question to uh, Mr. Reichler. Um, uh, in your talk, as you stated in your talk, uh, China uh, has rejected uh, the arbitral award. On the other hand, he, they stay within uh, the UNCLOS as a member signatory. And it seems to be uh, finding a, a basis of uh, their claims within UNCLOS. I'm sure that they are studying UNCLOS very much and very, very closely. If China, uh, after the award of arbitration, if China uh, tries to justify its uh, claims and if 
it tries to find a basis for their claims. What other uh, argument do you think that China is likely to put forward to justify their claims? Uh, I see none. Uh, in the interest of time, I would like to ask Mr. Reckler to answer that particular question. What other uh, arguments China is likely to take? Uh, thank you very much for asking such a good and very interesting question about an important topic. Uh, with your permission, I would like to enlarge upon it for a moment. Um, and let me ask a question rhetorically, which I will then do my best to answer. Why does China go to such lengths to defend its positions as consistent with UNCLOS, with the convention? I think that that is a very important question, and that is really at the heart of what Mr. Harada is asking. They're a big power. Why don't they just say, we don't care. We're the biggest power in this part of the world. We want the South China Sea, and there's nothing anybody can do to stop us. Well, I think it's important to think about that. And, and because, and of course, I don't know what is going on inside the Politburo uh, in Beijing. But what I imagine is that they have come to the conclusion that it is important for China's own self-interest that they present themselves to the world as respectful of international law, as respectful of a rules-based international order. And this is very important because states like China and the United States much of the time defend what they do, even when defending it may be very difficult, on the basis of international law. Why? Because they must believe it's in their own national self-interest to do so. And why is that? Because by defending their conduct on the basis of international law, they gain more influence with other states, more influence in the international community in general, than if they simply said, might makes right, we are the strongest, we will do what we want, and you have no choice but to accept it. In other words, what we call, what political scientists call, soft power. Soft power is real. And in the competition for influence, in the effort to defend, promote, expand a nation's self-interest, the ability to present itself as law-abiding, as reinforcing the system, as behaving in a way that is viewed as legally correct is very important, very important to its national interest. And this explains one of the reasons why, as imperfect as the system is, thank you to Professor Sakamoto, it is still important that we have this system because it imposes some constraints on behavior, on states' behavior. And if we are in a dialogue about what international law requires, what does the rule of law require, that's much healthier. It's a basis on which we can discuss with China. We might not agree now. It might be a long way before we can agree, but we are in the right kind of relationship 
rather than confronting each other on simply on the basis of power and might. Now, I remember at Davos, shortly, uh, I, I can't remember which year, I think it was either 2017, I believe, so it was two years ago, shortly after the presidential elections in the United States, President Xi went to Davos and proclaimed that China is the defender of the international legal order. Well, we, we wonder how, uh, um, how to take that. Um, and uh, I don't want to be uh, critical here. It's not my place. I, I don't want to put my hosts in an embarrassing situation. But um, my own personal reaction as an international lawyer, somebody who spent his whole life and career uh, uh, working for what I think is the strengthening of the international legal order in my own small way, case by case, argument by argument, building the prestige and the reputation of the International Court of Justice, I say, good. Because if he says that, then we can respond to him. Not Paul Reichler, I don't talk to President Xi. But the nations of the world, the states of the world can respond by saying, that's very good. However, when you behave this way, you are undermining the legal order rather than strengthening it, rather than showing China, great state that it is, is a responsible in, and law-abiding international citizen. There is a lot we can disagree on, but we are speaking the same vocabulary, with the same language, the language of law. This is, is very important. So we then get to the issue of how can we hold China legally accountable, as Professor Sakamoto said? Um, first, through dialogue, through reminding them, through argument. I think engagement is important. We see Chinese scholars, Chinese international lawyers. There are, there's been a, a growth in that industry international lawyers in China, you've, I'm sure you've come in contact with them. Many of them now come to lecture at or get graduate degrees at uh, law schools in the United States. And these are opportunities to engage. Now, uh, the, the study, the 500-page study that my friend Professor Sakamoto referred to, uh, uh, it, it, it seems like... Uh, propaganda written by lawyers for the Chinese Communist Party, although it's signed by the uh, Chinese Society of International Law. Well, um, there may be some limits on what their lawyers can say in, in Beijing, but it's important to engage with them. They have serious international lawyers and serious scholars, and uh, by engaging, the hope is we can show that in a rules-based international order, which is in everyone's best interest, including the interests of the great powers, after all, who wants the stability of a rules-based international order more than the most powerful? Because they have the most influence in, in setting the rules. But we can, in time, when I say we, I mean all of us in this room, around the world, those of us scholars, students, scholars in particular, even more than litigators like me, can show them that in a true rules-based international order, which we all strive for, which is in every nation's best interest, it's healthy for a state to lose once in a while. Because it, there is no better way to demonstrate your commitment to the rule of law than to have your case adjudicated by an impartial third party to lose and then comply. You have maybe lost something in the short run, but you have demonstrated that you are a state that cares about, that is committed to international law, and you have strengthened the system. And of course, I'm describing Japan in the whaling case. Maybe 
it was a loss on some level. In the long run, it was a great victory for Japan as a nation, as a member of the international community because of the way Japan responded. I'd also point to India in the arbitration uh, with, with Bangladesh. India quickly accepted an award that was very difficult uh, for it in that maritime delimitation. These, are exam these states have shown they are committed to a rules-based international order. I say about the United States, we should be doing the same. We could do no better, no better thing for international peace and security than to demonstrate our commitment to a rules-based international order by submitting a dispute to the court, even if we lose, and then accepting the result. Imagine the prestige that the United States would have following, following that. And with that, I would hope that these arguments, that these points can be made to the Chinese. If, you do, if you're not speaking to President Xi directly, you are speaking with Chinese scholars, with Chinese international lawyers, with the next generation of Chinese leaders. And we have to work step by step to bring China into the same mentality as Japan. They shouldn't be following Russia's example. They should be following Japan's example. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Reichler. Uh, starting from the comprehensive analysis of uh, uh, the presentation on the South China Sea uh, arbitration, uh, and uh, we have heard your views on uh, the comment, and also the emphasis on the rules-based international order. RBIS, a rules-based international system, is a term that is often used in the West nowadays, and I believe uh, uh, you talked about the importance of that, and also um, you give, gave us uh, some advice as to how Japan could uh, react and interact with China in the future regarding these uh, territorial issues. We would like to thank you very much uh, for this uh, very fine opening session with your keynote address. Please give uh, the speakers once again a big hand. So it is time to resume uh, with the panel discussion. It would not like to have the panel discussion on territory and maritime issues in East Asia and their origins. In this panel discussion, as panelists, we have uh, Professor Okamoto of Kyoto Prefecture University, Mr. Takai, Special Research Fellow of the Sasaka Peace Foundation, and uh, uh, Professor Sakai of Kyoto University. And discussions are. Um, distinguished visiting Professor Agawa of Doshi University and Professor Murata of Doshi University. Moderator is uh, Professor Asano of Doshi University, Center for Study of uh, South China Sea. And uh, uh, Mr. Paul Reichler and Professor Sakamoto will join the discussion after comments by the discussants. And in view of time, uh, we had to uh, cut short the Q&A. Uh, so, uh, but we do have uh, time available for question and answers later on as well. So, Professor Asano, would you please uh, moderate uh, the panel discussion? I am Asano. Uh, let me be seated, remain seated. Uh, we would like to begin the panel discussion on territory and maritime issues in East Asia and their origins. Uh, we would like to go to the origins of uh, territory and maritime issues in East Asia. And uh, this will be on page two in the Japanese program and on page six uh, in the English program. There are four issues to be discussed here. 
And uh, number one, historical and contemporary Chinese perceptions of borders and historical memory will be uh, discussed by Professor Okamoto. The second uh, issue, commercial activities conducted on islands in East Asia by the Japanese civilians before World War II and the responses of the Japanese government in connection with these commercial activities. And number three, the disposition of uh, territories under the uh, San Francisco Peace Treaty will be dealt uh, by uh, Mr. Takai. And number four, the postures of various countries on the current international maritime legal order, including UNCLOS and uh, other legal instruments, will be dealt by Professor Sakai. And we would like to hear from each of them for 15 minutes and uh, have discussions, uh, Professor Agawa and Murata, to give comments. So, may I ask uh, the panelists, uh, first of all, Professor Okamoto, to come to the podium. Thank you very much. Before the very kind introduction, I am Okamoto. The, the task given to me is to take a look at the history, Chinese history. Well, actually, uh, it seems to sound like a very massive field, although this is a field of mine. And um, as you can find in my resume, uh, and as a historian, I have uh, copied some Chinese characters I'm sure that no one really understands what they mean, but um, that's one trait, being a Chinese historian. As has been explained, uh, because of the time uh, pressure, I would like to just uh, pick out main points, and uh, I will also show some uh, maps and tables uh, on the screen as I go through my points. Uh, Mr. Reckler uh, used the legal language, and the legal language is a common language we can use in a dialogue or in engaging with China. They're encouraging words indeed, but on the other side of the coin, we are not speaking the same language with China today. What they say and what we say from Japan are not at all in line with each other. That's where we find today. But what is the historical background to the different courses the two countries have taken so far? So, uh, from uh, the history study point of view, I would like to make some uh, comments. And the theme is China's territorial sovereignty, and that's the area I would like to focus upon. Uh, the outset for a territorial sovereignty, I don't think I need to make any explanation about this, but in China, this terminology, territorial sovereignty, was born only a little over a hundred years ago. Before that, China didn't have a notion of territorial sovereignty. Then, a uh, hundred years ago, or before that, what was the order China had back in those days? And uh, in the resume, uh, you can find a section talking about the Qin Dynasty's world order. Uh, it seems that my voice is too loud for you to bear. So I will lower my voice a bit. So this is in Qin Dynasty. Um, I cannot go through the details, but uh, there are uh, four different categories in the Qin's world order. Uh, first, for uh, Fuxi, uh, linked by trade and commerce, and uh, tributaries, uh, which is called the uh, Shuguo. Uh, 
to be the reason vessels such as Korea, Ryukyu, and Vietnam, and the Fangu, indicated by a, a blue, Tibet, Mongolia, and um, uh, Chinese Turkestan today, and uh, Chinese provinces where um, Chinese as an ethnic group uh, lived. And this is the table that shows how four categories have evolved over the years. Uh, from the original Chinese documents, uh, I made such a table of uh, showing the evolution in the Chinese terms for the world order. Uh, first, Fuxi, uh, linked by trade, such as Western powers and Japan. Uh, they are shown at the bottom of this table, and those uh, states had a relationship with China uh, through treaties, and uh, early on they already had uh, diplomatic relations with China, uh, Qin Dynasty. But the question lies with other categories. Um, Shuguo, the tributaries, and the Fanbu. Uh, for the question of territorial sovereignty, these two categories have a very important point uh, for us to consider. Um, tributaries and Fanbu, uh, they are shown as two separate categories, but in my uh, resume, there is another term uh, called Fan Shu. And in certain cases, uh, Shu Guo or tributaries in Fan Bu are uh, grouped into one larger group called Fan Shu. After Sino Japanese War, um, uh, a Korean peninsula uh, became like this. After Sino Japanese War, uh, Korea won independence and uh, it became or it renamed itself a uh, Korean Empire. Uh, it was a tributary of China, but it became independent after Sino-Japanese War. So it achieved independence. It had graduated from the status of uh, uh, tributaries. And according to the document at the time, uh, Korea uh, grew out of being a fanshu, Chinese dependencies. So tributaries and fanbu are often grouped together in the documents back in those days. Uh, we have two slightly different blue colors, and the tributaries in fanbu are administered in different ways by Xin Dynasty, but often the case these two categories were treated more or less the same by Xin China, Dynasty China. I give you further explanation in my resume, but I will not go through them in detail. If you have any questions about such categorization, please raise a question later. So tributaries and vassals such as Korea and Ryukyu in Vietnam, uh, by the end of 19th century, all of them grew out of the position or status of uh, um, tributaries and vassals, and that is what I mean by a loss of shuguos or tributaries. And Korea also became an independent state uh, in 18. 97, and uh, uh, China uh, then experienced a very tough days of a scramble for concessions where Western powers came to China and uh, they partitioned uh, China into their small concessions uh, that continued uh, to uh, uh, the end of 19th century. and. Chinese at the time called this period a period of fear of partition. And uh, Xin dynasty leadership 
was uh, so afraid of uh, China being divided into smaller concessions by Western powers. But those tributaries were lost by China, but Fanbu still remained with China. And uh, Fanbu uh, in Qin Dynasty, China, was more or less uh, grouped together uh, the same way with the tributaries, but uh, China wanted to keep Fanbu under their control. Otherwise, uh, China would face uh, a more tougher danger. And that's how Xin Dynasty leadership looked at the situation. So, Fanbu, such as Tibet, Mongolia, and the Xinjiang, uh, Chinese Turk Turkestan, as I described uh, toward the end of page one to page two. Uh, Chinese diplomats who were stationed in Western countries who learned Western histories and philosophies began to call Fanbu Chinese colonies. And uh, that sentiment was strengthened uh, in 1880s and 1890s. And uh, those uh, fambus were therefore called gradually. Shu uh, Di. But uh, in Chinese characters, the word Shu Di uh, looks very similar to tributaries. And from Western powers and Japanese point of view, those Shudi uh, apparently look the same with Fanbu or tributaries. So Chinese leadership felt something that they have to do something um, in order to escape the danger of being divided by Western powers uh, from the North Russian powers and uh, uh, British India. Uh, this area is sandwiched by these two powers, uh, imperialist uh, states. Uh, try to exercise the influence over such regions. And in the face of such a threat, China wanted to keep those areas such as Tibet and Mongolia within their influence. And in 1905, even before that, in this map, uh, uh, the whole China uh, is painted red, and this means that China was under immunity. It seems to indicate uh, their efforts to build a nation state. Chinese as a nation, it was, in a sense, a booth of nationalism in China. And Xu Di or Fanbu, uh, such as uh, Tibet, Mongolia, and uh, Chinese Turkestan, how can they be positioned under such circumstances? And in that effort, uh, China found a concept of uh, territorial sovereignty. Before that, suzerainty, which was a rather ambiguous notion, once the word uh, they used to use, uh, be it Xu Di or Xu Guo or Fanbu, all of them were translated into English as dependencies. It simply means a dependent relationship on China. 
同じような運命をたどりかねないというですね、But、危機感が、えー、中国の中に生まれてます。Uh, Tibet and Mongolia are simply called、uh, a dependency, and they might be taken away from China, like the case with Korea.、Um, so they decided to begin to use the word territory rather than using the word suzerainty. And、uh, this notion of ryoshu in Japanese was uh, uh, more or less uh, used uh, in Chinese uh, context also.、Uh, in 1911 to 1912, when China was uh, transformed from a Xin Dynasty to a republic. Sovereignty、uh, began to be more or less established in the Chinese language as、uh, sovereignty used in the word of、uh, territorial sovereignty. So the notion of territorial sovereignty took roots in China.、Uh, but those areas like、uh, Tibet or Mongolia or Korea were Fango and、uh, Fanbu. And they were also called Fan Shu.、Uh, Tibet, Mongolia, not only them, but also Korea and Vietnam, which were tributaries, they were also、uh, regarded as Fan Su. But Korea was taken away from China's influence. And was、um, uh, given independence, and they didn't want Tibet or Mongolia or other、uh, Shugo or Fanbu、uh, fall in the same destiny、uh, like、uh, Korea. They didn't want to、uh, have、uh, their independence from、uh, China. So, uh, this Uh, is uh, China in the Republican era, and this is a map、uh, used in China back in those days, and this is their territory,、uh, and uh, the uh, territory lost the area they want to regain.、Uh, Is uh, what was distributed in China in those days. So、uh, this was more or less a strong imprint in Chinese concept of territorial sovereignty. And that seems to be an original starting point of the notion of territorial sovereignty in China. So the current disputes seem to go back to such an era and history. As their origin. Thank you very much. Professor Okamoto, thank you very much. Next,、uh, I invite Mr. Takai. Good afternoon, I'm Takai. I'm here to discuss、uh, the、uh, incorporation of islands into the territory of Japan. I have many things that I would like to talk about, but only given 15 minutes. So I might have to speak fast. I'm sorry to the interpreters. So, first of all, I think、uh, you're all aware of this.、Uh, how do we determine、uh, the scope of the territory?、Uh, uh, the acquisition of territory by state and the scope of the territory are regulated by international law. This is a, a basic understanding. And I'm sure you would、uh, recognize that、uh, Japan is a country which has been abiding、uh, very strictly by the international law. And,、uh, but despite of the, this diligence,、uh, we don't、uh, have Takeshi. Shima、oh, regarding Senkaku, we still have disputes. And、uh, international law 
Uh, discusses uh, four elements in terms of territory title. One is uh, accretion and occupation. Second, now accretion is acquiring territory created by natural phenomena. Uh, the most recent example is Nishinoshima. Uh, the subsea volcano has erupted uh, and the territory has expanded. So it is uh, a natural phenomenon within the territory of Japan which increased the ter land territory. Territory. So once you have an, a volcano eruption uh, and uh, an island is created, uh, it already it all, all automatically becomes uh, the country's uh, um, territory. Now I would like to limit my uh, discussion here to occupation here and not uh, talk about prescription, but occupation is acquiring territory that does not belong to any other state. But there are conditions for this. Uh, the territory it needs to be terra nullius. It, it, in other words, it is uh, not a territory of anyone else. It is unoccupied. And a mere discovery of the territory leads to what is known as an inchoate title to territory. There needs to be an intent to occupy the territory and uh, the act to exercise effective control over the territory for a prolonged period of time. That's uh, occupation. Now, what are the bilateral or mutual means of acquiring uh, territory? in the form of uh, signing treaties, a mutual agreement. There are two fold here. One is annexation, a transfer of a territory in its entirety. The most famous is 1910 Japan-Korea Treaty. The Korean Peninsula became a Japanese territory, and uh, uh, this was uh, mutually agreed upon by the two governments. The second uh, is a session. Uh, this is transfer of a part of a territory. And uh, one session takes place in peacetime, another session may take place in, during wartime. So in peacetime, you may transfer territory through a sale or exchange. In, an example is the 1875 Treaty of St. Petersburg. In wartime, uh, there's a transfer of territory after a peace treaty is signed that ends hostilities. And as a result of that, this always includes uh, uh, provisions on territory. So 1895 Treaty of Shimonoseki uh, for the first Sino-Japanese War, uh, 1905 Treaty of Portsmouth uh, for the Russo-Japanese War uh, could be given as uh, two examples. In this case, a southern part of Sakhalin is ceded by Russia to Japan. So, what is the scope of Japan's island territories? It's quite vast, and what is shown in weight is the exclusive economic zone, and we are number 11 in the world in terms of the area. And uh, as you see on the right-hand side, Ogasawara Island. Uh, allows us uh, to um, claim a large, a vast scope of territories. And uh, uh, this is an area uh, where a lot of mi mineral resources are being found. Uh, and uh, the northern territories and Takeshima Island and the Senkaku. These islands are rather small, but I try to make it look big, just on the map. But facing the Pacific, in these islands, uh, I would like to talk about how they have been incorporated into Japan and Japanese territory. Ogasawara Islands, uh, we have uh, the Volcano Islands and Okinotorishima Island, the Minami Torishima Island, and uh, these are what constitutes the Ogasawara uh, Islands uh, under the Tokyo municipality. And uh, uh, 1593 is the oldest record when Sadayori Ogasawara landed on the island and uh, uh, erected uh, uh, wooden markers there. And uh, uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu uh, named it Ogasawara Island and uh, gave uh, Sadayori this island as his fief. It was unmanned uh, for some 
for centuries after that, but in 1830, uh, 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 foreigners uh, also landed on the island, and some of them uh, lived on the island. There were about uh, 20 Kanakas uh, coming from Hawaii who landed and uh, started started to settling there. And the Japanese uh, started a full-scale settlement uh, in, from 1860s onwards. And uh, people who were migrated from Hachijo Island, however, um, in 1863, everyone evacuated or withdrew. That is, all Japanese evacuated from the island uh, because it was difficult uh, to develop Ogasawara. Uh, government offices office was set up on the island and uh, laws and regulations were put in place uh, in 1876 uh, and uh, the exercising of jurisdiction was uh, notified uh, to the foreign uh, ambassadors uh, and uh, uh, Germany, France, uh, uh, Netherlands, uh, Spain acknowledge uh, this uh, notification, but the United States and uh, uh, Britain replied that they found parts of Japan's decision to be unacceptable and um, and protested. But uh, not many uh, foreign countries uh, were interested in the islands, and therefore Japan kept its uh, territory. In 1921, uh, the population exceeded uh, 7,000 people, but that was uh, the, uh, the peak of Ogasawara. As for volcano islands, the presence uh, was known, but it was uh, for many years a uh, terra nullius. But in 1889, Eijiro Tanaka and a dozen more res other residents of Ogasawara settled in the islands to engage in fishing and sulfur mining. And farming uh, was conducted uh, by growing sugarcane, coca leaves, and lemongrass. Uh, the government of Tokyo Prefecture asked uh, the national government uh, uh, to make clear the extent of jurisdiction over the islands in 1891. And uh, the national government gave names uh, to these islands, uh, Kitaiwo, Iwo, and Minami Iwo, and placed them under the authority of the Ogasawara Island Government of Tokyo Prefecture. Uh, based on the cabinet decision. Foreign countries did not protest the Japanese decision at that time. And the population increased to about a thousand, uh, but uh, with the war, uh, islanders were evacuated uh, in 1944. There is a, a Japan uh, Marine, Maritime Self-Defense Forces uh, based there, but uh, the population and uh, well, the islanders never returned there. Now, Okino Torishima Island has become smaller and smaller by the year, and uh, um, this has been on the Spanish chart uh, from about 17th century. Uh, and the name was Paracevera at that time. But uh, the island was regarded as uninhabited and not in the possession of any country. So in July 1931, the government of Japan uh, considered this as Telenarius and placed the island under its jurisdiction of uh, Tokyo Prefecture as part of Ogasawara's. Minami e Torishima. This is located at the southernmost uh, and of the Japanese territories. Not only expedition uh, came there, but uh, in 1864, a report uh, was made uh, uh, of the presence of this island. And uh, in 1896, uh, Shinroku Mizutani drifted onto the island, and uh, Mizutani had 23 people come from Ogasawara to relocate to the island to engage in fishing and bird hunting. In 1898, uh, he filed for lease of the island to the government, and uh, uh, the government uh, decides to incorporate the island into Tokyo Prefecture in July 1898, after receiving this petition of, of filing from Izdani. 
In May 1902, the village of Mizutani was established on the island, and uh, there were about uh, 60 settlers, Japanese, who engaged in extracting, uh, engaging in various ac economic activities. So, Okasara uh, had uh, uh, visitors uh, like uh, Perry, Commodore Perry as well, but uh, it's not written here, but uh, there were views uh, or arguments uh, 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 that said the U.S. United States should take ownership uh, of this island, uh, but uh, uh, the discussion did not uh, progress uh, thereafter and uh, remained um, a Japanese uh, uh, territory. Now, Takeshima, it, cons it consists of two islets, Ojima and Mejima, in the Sea of Japan. And in the early 17th century, the Tokugawa shogunate authorized two merchant families to conduct fishing and other economic activities, uh, activities in Utsuryo Island. So it was a very rich island, and much is written in the records from those days. And at that time, Takeshima was called Matsushima. The current Takeshima, uh, therefore, was used uh, as uh, a stopover point uh, going to Utsuryo Island. And, uh, the, but the Korean envoys uh, requested uh, the Chogunet uh, that Japanese uh, should not be traveling to Utsuryo Island. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, the shogunate did not ban um, people to travel to Takeshima. Nakai Yosaburo filed a petition with the government of Japan in 1904 to ask for Takeshima to be incorporated into Japan. And Japanese government did so based on cabinet decision in 1905. And Nakai Yozaburo conducted various economic activities on the island. After, we, after this, uh, Korea conducted uh, various activities uh, to uh, come to uh, possess the island uh, or have continued to claim uh, the ownership of the island ever since. Now, what is the situation with Senkaku Island? Uh, it consists of eight islands, and uh, the Imperial Japanese Navy began surveying the islands in 1885, and uh, uh, the Navy con confirmed that the islands were not under the control of the Qing Dynasty or any other country, and uh, uh, therefore in, in 1894, uh, Kogatsu Tatsushiro, a businessman, filed a petition with the Japanese government asking for a lease on island ter territory, and uh, in 1895, the Japanese government approved of, in the cabinet decision to build a marker on the island and incorporate them into the country's territory. And about 200 uh, people at its peak uh, were carrying out uh, various uh, economic activities uh, to harvest uh, and process bonito or catch seabirds uh, for the down feathers. Um, in the uh, post-war period, uh, according to the Treaty of Peace with Japan, uh, they were placed under U.S. administration and uh, China opposed uh, against uh, this move. In 1970, it was announced that the area around the Senkaku may have subterranean ore deposits, and all of a sudden China began to assert that the islands were long part of Japan China and asserted territorial sovereignty over the islands. And, uh, and in 1972, the Senkakus were returned to Japan as part of Okinawa, and Japan has administered Ireland since then. Uh, as to the situation with the Northern Territories, this is Hokkaido, and there is 
in uh, 1855, uh, the Treaty of Commerce and Navigation between Japan and Russia drew the boundary between the two countries at the point between the islands of Etorofu and Europe. Uh, Russian uh, Tsar agreed uh, to draw the line there. As uh, for Saharin, uh, Karafto, uh, these, they, it, it was uh, placed under joint control at that time. And under the 1875 Treaty of St. Petersburg, Russia peacefully ceded the Kuril Islands to Japan in exchange of Saharin, Karavto. Until World War II, about uh, 17,000 Japanese inhabited the islands and engaged in fishing and uh, kelp harvesting. And the Treaty of Portsmouth that ended the Russo-Japanese War divided Sahalin at south of 50, um, uh, 50th barrel, you know, the south of, of uh, 50 degrees uh, north uh, latitude had been ceded uh, by coercion and became a Japanese uh, uh, territory. Uh, the Soviet army advanced into the Kuros in 1945 and landed in the Northern Territories. The Soviets expelled the Japanese inhabitants and occupied uh, the territories. Now, uh, the war came to an end uh, with uh, uh, the Potsdam Declaration, and uh, it, uh, it says that uh, the minor islands uh, would be determined by the Allies. And, but in the Cairo Declaration, it says that the Allies covet no gain for themselves and have no thought for territorial expansion. Uh, and uh, uh, as a result of all the, the Cairo Declaration and Potsdam Declaration, um, the uh, San Francisco Peace uh, Treaty entered into effect, uh, and, uh, which says that Japan, uh, recognizing the, the independence of Korea, renounces all right, title, and claim to Korea, etc. And so what happened, after all, is that regarding Ogasawa's, in according in accordance with Article 3, Japan placed the Ogasawas under the trusteeship system uh, with the United States as a whole sole administrating authority, and the Ogasawa Islands uh, were reverted to Japan in, in 1968. As for Takeshima, uh, South uh, Korea uh, calls uh, the island Dokdo, uh, asserting that Dokdo was non Korean territory and that it is a part of Korea which Japan renounced in accordance with the San Francisco Peace. Treaty. South Korea, of course, was not a signatory to the treaty. It was found out uh, that uh, when the treaty was being drafted, South Korea asked the United States to have Takashima treated as part of Korea. But uh, the United States refused the request. South Korea asserts uh, that uh, SCAPIN, Supreme Command of Allied Powers Instruction Note 677 and 1033, issued during the Allied occupation of Japan, excluded Takeshima from Japanese uh, territory. And uh, uh, Korea bases its uh, justification uh, of the ownership of Takeshima on this. Especially in number 677 and 1033, uh, says that it is not the final uh, decision uh, of uh, uh, border de demarcation. However, but despite this fact, uh, South Korea unilaterally declared sovereignty over the water surrounding Takeshima in January 1952 and drew the Syngman Ri line, making Takeshima part of Korea. After the end of the war, uh, when Japanese uh, fishing ships uh, started to uh, conduct academic activities in the waters, they have been seized by the Koreans. And uh, Japan protests very strongly against the Syngman Ri line, uh, but uh, uh, 
the South Korea uh, continues to occupy Takeshima by force. And in 1956, when the Treaty of Basic Relations between ROK and Japan was signed, uh, relations were normalized, and still Takashima remains occupied by South Korea. Now, finally, on Senkaku Island, PRC asserts that the Senkaku was discovered by China and that they were they form part of Taiwan, which Japan relinquished in the San Francisco Peace Treaty. And by the way, PRC was formed in 1949 after the Communist Party took part in China. So PRC was not a signatory to the San Francisco Peace Treaty. But uh, they can say that they are the justified successor uh, to the to China. Under Article 3 of the treaty, the Senkakus were placed under trustee trusteeship along with Okinawa, and the United States served as a sole administrator. So this is Okinawa, this is the Senkaku Islands, and Senkaku Islands were returned to Japan in 1972 along with Okinawa. China declared the Senkakus to be a core national of a core national interest in 2012, and as uh, Professor Okamoto said, uh, they are going, come, going to come and can't take it. Uh, uh, Tibet and Uyghur and uh, Taiwan uh, were mentioned as core national interest in 2009, but they have expanded that in 2012 to include Senkakus and has established an air defense identification zone over the islands. Also, in 2012, uh, the Japanese uh, government acquired uh, uh, land uh, on some of the Senkaku Islands uh, from their civilian owners, and Chinese uh, uh, ships uh, uh, began repeatedly entering uh, Japanese territorial waters near Uotsuri, uh, um, understanding that the Japanese government uh, nationalized the land. Uh, it was only uh, a state of property land. Uh, it was not nationalized as such, but uh, that was what uh, China said. Uh, as for northern territories, um, uh, Russia has not signed the San Francisco Peace Treaty. In 1945, there was a Yalta Agreement. And uh, the Allies uh, said that the uh, Salin and uh, uh, Kuril Islands uh, were to be returned uh, to uh, Soviet Union. So that's uh, the justification for Russia's claim uh, on these islands or the territories. In 1956, a Soviet-Japanese joint declaration uh, was uh, issued uh, in which uh, USSR agreed to hand over the Habamais and the Shikotan to Japan uh, in case after a peace treaty is signed in the future. But uh, uh, um, with the uh, Japan-U.S. Security Treaty um, being signed, uh, uh, Russia took that uh, word uh, back, uh, saying saying that uh, they would not accept uh, the situation in which there may be possibility that uh, the American forces uh, may be stationed on the Northern Territories. And so now uh, the two governments are in negotiation uh, over these uh, Russian uh, the Northern Territories now occupied by Russia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Takai. Now let us turn to Professor Sakai. Well, thank you very much. I am Sakai with Kyoto University. Uh, my area of specialty is international law. So uh, today in this symposium on East Asian territorial and maritime issues and international, I'd like to give a um, short presentation. Uh, in this uh, report of mine, I would like to review the international law concerning territorial and maritime issues in East Asia and consider the role of international law in those issues. First, uh, uh, international law for territorial issues and 
and that for maritime issues uh, cover different uh, contents and the details are given in the paper uh, so please look at them later and um, if uh, such international law is concretized um, uh, through uh, uh, the international uh, customary uh, law and treaties and uh, 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 they are also reconfirmed through the rulings in international tribunals or state practices. International law has a substantive aspect of uh, governing the issues, uh, but at the same time, international law uh, provides a mechanism of procedures to resolve uh, conflict between the states. Now, international law and territorial issues. Well, traditionally, uh, international law sets out the set of rules that determine which territory belongs to which state. And the important concept here is a title. Uh, Professor Takai has already explained what title is, and it is a fact which supports effective exercise uh, of a territorial sovereignty. And it comes in different types, uh, occupation, uh, acquisition, cession, uh, and uh, uh, prescription. For certain time periods, discovery and subjugation may also be considered as a title. And some parties to a conflict or dispute they may also assert that their claims based upon historic titles which come from historic facts. Uh, China, in the case mentioned earlier, um, used historic facts and historic uh, rights. And also, in some cases, although this is not strictly a title, especially in international tribunals, a notion of effective occupation uh, has been utilized and uh, as was pointed out in 1928, the island of Palmas uh, case uh, in international tribunals, a effective occupation or continuous and peaceful display of territorial sovereignty is considered important in a dispute which title or claim uh, is uh, stronger than the other. Such a comparison uh, is often done. And if that is not enough, then a continuous and peaceful display of territorial uh, sovereignty or effectivities were taken into consideration in international tribunals. No about international forum for dispute resolution. For territorial disputes, besides negotiation between parties, the third party mechanism and institutions such as ICJ and state-to-state uh, -state arbitration uh, fora are used. But the use of such a third party mechanism requires consent of uh, the parties to a dispute. Um, sovereign state uh, has the freedom to select the means of dispute resolution, so court jurisdiction over such a matter uh, can be established only with uh, the consent of all other parties to a dispute. Furthermore, there is no enforcement institution in the international society for a implementation uh, of a arbitral award or uh, judicial uh, rulings. Uh, therefore, the final resolution of dispute is after all, are left with uh, the consent of the parties to a dispute. As uh, important procedural rules of international law, uh, there is uh, the principle of intertemporal law and also the notion of critical date. 
In the temporal law, provides that uh, international law about it at that point in time uh, needs to be interpreted and applied. Uh, in uh, the other, the Palmer's arbitration case, a distinction, distinction was made between the creation and existence of rights and uh, international law uh, applicable uh, for each time period uh, had to be identified. On the other hand, a critical date refers to the date when a dispute erupted or when a territorial sovereignty was uh, crystallized, uh, its um, uh, attribution was crystallized. For instance, uh, in 1953, ICJ ruling of a Manquier Equio case uh, between UK and France. Uh, it was uh, 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 stated that uh, in principle facts prior to the critical date uh, needs to be considered about depending upon uh, the specific uh, nature of a case, uh, acts and uh, facts uh, after a critical date may also be considered. Now on East Asia territorial issues, first let me start with the Takeshima Island issues. Uh, the dispute over those islands erupted uh, between the two countries in 1952 when Korea issued a proclamation of a maritime sovereignties, as Professor uh, Takai mentioned, that is the establishment of uh, uh, Shin Man Ri line and a Japanese uh, protest against it. And uh, if we follow the definition of critical date, as I explained earlier, uh, 1952 would be considered a critical date for a Takeshima Islands dispute. Uh, what are the claims of the two countries over these islands? Japan argues that Takeshima uh, has been under Japanese position since the opening of the country, and in 1905, Japan uh, incorporated uh, the islands into Japanese territory and made public notice of it. On the other hand, um, ROK uh, acknowledges uh, the presence of no such dispute, uh, but uh, it also uh, argues that even before 1905, territorial incorporation by Japan, it has possessed uh, uh, the islands and also those islands, uh, according to them, are part of the territory over which Japan renounced its sovereignty in uh, the 1951 peace treaty. Uh, if drawing a Shinman-ri line it is proven to be a challenge against Japan's sovereignty uh, then uh, by applying critical date strictly, uh, all acts after that critical date will fall out of legal consideration and Japan may be able to win a ruling in its favor. Now on Senkaku Islands, as shown uh, in uh, my handouts, uh, there are various developments uh, over the years. I will not go into the details. Now, Japanese arguments. Uh, Japan has never acknowledged a presence of any dispute over Senkaku Islands. And uh, since uh, it's incorporation into Japanese territory through the principle of occupation of terra nullius, uh, it has uh, been holding those islands under effective uh, possession. On the other hand, PRC, China, uh, argues that uh, those islands have been historically part of China and also a part of Taiwan, which according to them, um, Japan renounced uh, in San Francisco Peace Treaty. Uh, today, it is Japan which uh, has an effective occupation of the islands, and if 1971, when the PRC launched the protest against Japan uh, as a critical date, then a Japanese effective occupation afterwards uh, would be adopted as an evidence that confirms the legal status of those islands prior to the critical date. Uh, therefore, at a third party institution, Japanese territorial rights over those islands uh, may be accepted. Now on Northern Islands. 
Uh, Japan and Russia has concluded various uh, treaties as shown in this uh, table. So, in a sense, uh, the territorial issues between the two countries uh, is uh, chiefly a issue of uh, a treaty interpretation. In Article 2, uh, Section C of uh, um, Peace Treaty in San Francisco, Japan renounced all rights, title, and claims to Kuril Islands. And the Japanese government argues that those Kuril Islands are islands of Urup and to the north of Urup. And uh, based upon um, uh, the uh, Japan-Russia uh, Treaty of Commerce, uh, island Etorofu and islands to the south of Etorofu are uh, Japanese inherent uh, territories. On the other hand, uh, Russia argues that all four northern islands were reverted uh, to the Soviet Union uh, through Japan's um, uh, unconditional surrender and occupation. And as uh, Professor Takai mentioned, um, the Japan-Soviet joint declaration of 1956 states that uh, upon uh, the conclusion of peace treaty between the two countries, Habama Islands and Shikotai Islands will be handed over to Japan. So we have to um, uh, wait for a further progress in the negotiation between Japan and Russia over this matter. Now, maritime issues and international law. Uh, uh, very briefly, upon the history of uh, our law of the sea, it has a long history. Uh, but it developed substantially after the end of World War II. Uh, in 1945, the then President of the United States, uh, Truman, uh, argued and stated uh, that the United States has the right uh, to seabed mining and a, a right to conserve uh, fishing resources in its coast. And in 1956, a four Geneva Conventions on the Law of the Sea were adopted in 1982 after a little over 10 years of negotiation, and UNCLOS was adopted as the Constitution of the Sea. And UNCLOS today it sets the basis for maritime legal order and in exchange for the extended jurisdiction of the coastal states and a formation of a deep seabed regime in exchange for such systems, some systems such as uh, the uh, freedom of uh, innocent passage uh, and uh, transit passage in international straits were introduced, which were uh, more or less in favor of uh, the uh, big maritime countries. So, uh, in the field of uh, international maritime law, uh, various uh, universal and uh, regional uh, treaties were adopted uh, issue by issue, and they all form a kind of network uh, that uh, together form a, a maritime legal order today. Uh, there are some important features concerning maritime legal regime today. One is a use of zoning for the application of international law. Uh, before that, there were only two zones, uh, territorial or sea, uh, overstate and the high seas. But today, besides them, uh, there are other zones. So in a sense, it's now a multi-zonal order. The second feature is as follows. Degrees of jurisdiction uh, of coastal states uh, vary zone by zone. Uh, uh, for instance, in territorial sea, a coastal state uh, exercises its uh, sovereignty comprehensively, uh, whereas in EEZ and coastal shelves, a coastal state has its jurisdiction only on um, fishing resources and uh, non-living resources. The third feature is that um, the present uh, maritime legal 
uh, regime was formed against the background of balancing the interests of coastal states and freedom of navigation. United States operates free navigation of naval vessels in various uh, uh, waters today uh, in a sense to reconfirm uh, the interests of a flag state uh, vis a vis the title of a coastal state. Uh, issues of uh, uh, marine resources management and uh, uh, distribution uh, has uh, given rise to a new issue that is the maritime boundary delimitation. Uh, in 1958, the Convention on Continental Shelf provides for a equidistance principle for the delimitation of a overlap continental shelves. Uh, uh, but in 1969, ICJ ruling on North Sea, a consideration was given to West Germany, uh, which was given a disadvantage when a only equidistance principle was applied. And so in that ruling, uh, the notion of natural prolongation was emphasized, and also a principle of uh, equity uh, was put forward. Uh, in UNCLOS, uh, it speaks of a equitable solution uh, to be achieved through the consensus of the countries uh, concerned and also in subsequent uh, rulings, uh, there emerged a tension between equidistance, the median line principle, and the principle of uh, uh, equity and relevant circumstances. Uh, at the end of the day in 2009, as if to emerge those two approaches uh, in ICJ ruling on the Black uh, Sea uh, demarcation case adopted three-stage approach. Uh, this approach was already explained by Mr. Reckler, uh, but if I may uh, reiterate, the first step is to draw a provisional median line and to make adjustment to achieve a equitable solution. And lastly, a proportionality test is applied to consider the length of the relevant coasts and uh, uh, maritime areas. This three-step approach it has been uh, adopted uh, in uh, Italos and the various uh, maritime boundary delimitation cases in international arbitration. Now on fishing issues, uh, fisheries issues in East Asia. Between Japan and uh, uh, South Korea, with the establishment of uh, the uh, Shin Manri line, the relationship became really sour. Uh, but in 1965, uh, two countries uh, uh, concluded the fisheries agreement, which established uh, uh, the EEZ uh, up to 12 miles from each coast. And then, in line with the, the adoption of UNCLOS in 1998, a new fisheries agreement was reached between the two countries, which is still valid today. Between Japan and the PRC, uh, since uh, after uh, the diplomatic normalization uh, between Japan and uh, China in 1975, a fisheries agreement was uh, concluded. And also, uh, in line with the provisions of AMPUS, a uh, new fisheries agreement was signed in 1997. Uh, this agreement sets a provisional measure zone between the two countries and set the ground for a preservation and management measures of uh, um, biological resources. The interesting uh, relationship between Japan and Taiwan, there is no diplomatic relationship between the two, uh, so treaty cannot be formed. Uh, so in 2013, a uh, more or less uh, semi uh, 
governmental organizations of the two countries uh, formed and signed a fisheries agreement. And there are also continental shelf issues in East Asia for non-living resources. Uh, the countries concerned need to conclude an agreement for a development or management. In 1974, Japan and ROK uh, reached a, a agreement uh, which set forth a joint development zone in the south uh, part of uh, uh, the sea. The problem or question uh, here is that continental shelf between Japan and China in East China Sea. Uh, there is an overlap of the two continental shelves between the two countries. As was mentioned by Mr. Reckler, Japan uh, argues for a median line, uh, whereas China um, claims the use of uh, natural prolongation to Okinawa uh, trough. But as has been stated in recent uh, international uh, rulings, three-stage approach has been adopted, and uh, from uh, that uh, criteria, uh, Chinese seem to be overclaiming uh, its continental shelves. According to the definition by AMPLUS, a state may set the outer edge of the continental shelf beyond 200 nautical miles. But in order to achieve such an extension of the continental shelf beyond 200 miles, uh, the uh, coastal state uh, needs to make a submission with the sufficient data to CLCS. Uh, in 2008, Japan made this submission uh, to the committee uh, for seven zones, uh, including Okino-Torishima uh, area. Against this, China and ROK objected uh, that Okino-Torishima is not an island, therefore cannot generate continental shelf. CLCS in 2012 approved uh, extension of uh, the continental shelves uh, in its recommendation to Japan in areas other than Okino Toyoshima South. And this issue has an important uh, connection with uh, the legal standing of Okino Toyoshima. Uh, this island uh, is uh, the southernmost island of Japan, 1,700 kilometers south of Tokyo, uh, a coral reef island. Uh, it's um, uh, Territory is a 10 kilometer long and east to west 4.5 kilometer and north to south 1.7 kilometers at, at the uh, biggest. Uh, at high tide, uh, two parts of the island uh, stay above the waters. Japan uh, considers this as Okino Torishima, and it also uh, argues that it is an island uh, from uh, the definition of Ampus. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Korea and China argues that it's not an island, according to Anklos. Uh, in this uh, regard, uh, the interpretation of uh, Article 121 of Anklos uh, is uh, very important, uh, as it was shown in uh, the South China Sea Arbitral Award uh, spoken about by Mr. Reckler, but in this after award, um, there is uh, no active definition of rock, uh, and also um, uh, the purpose of EEZ was incorporated into the interpretation of this article, and there was no consideration given to a state practice. So we need to see uh, how this arbitral award would uh, impact uh, the subsequent state practices. So in summary, there are four points I would like to make through my uh, contribution. Number one, uh, territorial and maritime issues are both governed by international law. Secondly, the role of international law in those regards is to provide a, a code of conduct for sovereign states, among others, and encourage them to take a rule-based 
behaviors and acts and provide a criteria of resolving the issues when a dispute arises. Number three is the compliance with such international law would uh, contribute to the stability of international society, regional society, and uh, be conducive to the development of international law. Uh, number four, international law uh, resolves only a legal aspect of a dispute in order to resolve the whole dispute, uh, not just international law, but other criteria and perspectives need to be brought into. Thank you very much. Professor Sakai, thank you very much. Law, uh, we have heard uh, from uh, the professors uh, specializing in law and history, but it's uh, rather difficult to uh, limit their time. Uh, uh, we, uh, as organizer, if I may suggest that we uh, extend uh, the uh, time frame of uh, this uh, symposium uh, to be extended by 15 minutes, if that's okay with all of you. And also, uh, may I ask uh, uh, everyone else to speak within three to five minutes in making comments after this? And so I would invite uh, Professor Agawa and Professor Murata to give comments as discussants, and uh, we'll allow the three uh, panelists uh, uh, to respond. And uh, I would be asking uh, Mr. Reitler and uh, Professor Sakamoto uh, to uh, give uh, comments uh, to conclude uh, and uh, hope that we would have as much time as possible for free discussion. So I would like to speak in three minutes. Please uh, remind me if I pass the time. I've never spoken in three minutes, though. So. The role that is given to me is uh, for time adjustment. So I would uh, like to be as brief as possible. I'm not an expert specializing in this area, and therefore I would like to give my impressions. Uh, I uh, was uh, I was uh, I had a chance uh, to uh, talk with the uh, uh, Dutch ambassador and. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, we were to speak about uh, uh, Senkaku, uh, but uh, uh, but uh, it was interesting that uh, they said that uh, um, the ICJ is based in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, they are very uh, keen about uh, uh, complying with international uh, law, uh, but uh, uh, they had uh, Netherlands was beaten by the British so bad, and therefore, when uh, you are beaten and uh, in a weak position, uh, we tend to abide with the international law. So, why uh, China would not withdraw from UNCLOS? was a question that was addressed. And uh, why is it uh, that uh, Japan is uh, keen on uh, keeping uh, um, its position in UNCLOS? And uh, also, may I also talk about uh, why Japan may be interested in uh, various uh, cases uh, around the world on borders and territories? I think uh, all countries are interested, uh, based on national interest, uh, to save their territory. And uh, in, of course, uh, I believe it was a good thing that uh, the South China Sea situation could be linked to, to the East China Sea situation. And by uh, learning from that, uh, we would be able to share uh, the experience uh, that uh, procedures uh, could be taken uh, to uh, take steps uh, to secure one's own territory. And so it was a, a learning experience. And uh, so we never know what China will be doing in Senkaku, but I believe uh, we can uh, study very uh, study a lot from what happened in the South China Sea arbitration case, and also uh, we may uh, be uh, involved somewhat in the South China Sea with the South Defense Forces and going past the South China Sea. We we are interested in international arbitration because we cannot uh, contribute, uh, militarily speaking. We won't be using military force, and therefore Japan-U.S. Uh, 
relations, uh, international relations is uh, what we can uh, work on. Even though it may not be directly an issue that uh, involves Japan, Japan has started to realize that uh, it is important to play a role in whatever means possible. And so it is a proactive uh, peace policy. And uh, in case I think uh, all of these uh, territory issues uh, may be linked uh, to Senkaku. In other words, Minami um, Torishima, uh, we don't know what is going to happen uh, to that uh, for Japan, but lose some, win some is a principle. And also, we have uh, uh, been uh, trying to abide with the international law. Uh, but uh, uh, during the Manchuria incident, uh, Japan, uh, the whole uh, world did not accept uh, Japan's position. So I think uh, we have uh, had uh, a lesson to learn from these experience in the past. Perhaps uh, we need to uh, cherish idealism. But to be realistically ideal, I think uh, international law could be used as a means. And uh, there may be a possibility of uh, having resolution uh, to a uh, dispute without the fighting wars. And uh, I think uh, no man is an island in time on itself. It, everyone is a part of the continent, that British poet said. And we should not be thinking all by ourselves. But of course, uh, we may don't want to favor China or give advantage to China. Uh, I think uh, we need to have a legitimacy in the world and uh, Together, we need to think about international law from the standpoint of hard power as well as from soft power, I guess. Thank you very much. So I'll be quick also. Uh, we received a tense explanation about international law. Um, as a political scientist, I'd like to give you the following comments. Um, the maritime and territorial issues in this particular part of the world is very difficult, and power balance is rapidly changing as a backdrop to this difficulty. And as I heard from the China's history, and be it Japan, uh, Sino-Japanese War and World War II were fought, uh, and at the very uh, final battle of World War II, Japan lost, and Japanese people are still somewhat uh, dissatisfied with that end. And Chinese people, I think, also uh, hover a kind of frustration over the history. And from a Korean point of view, the Japan-Korean treaty was uh, concluded based upon the power balance back in those days. So in a sense, um, the Constitution was forced onto Japan uh, by the United States during the time of uh, occupation. Some Japanese people have a sense of dissatisfaction, and such a mood of feelings uh, people have hovered over the years cannot be neglected when we consider such disputes. And a very precise discussion concerning international law is very important, but at the same time, we need to make translation, uh, not uh, only language translation, we need to translate what international law says in a plain language which uh, people on the streets understand, and that's very difficult. And we need to consider the public opinion of our own country and the public opinion of the other country, and also the public opinion of the whole international community. And we have to apply different thoughts of uh, translation into plain language. Uh, we need to explain our claims in a plain language which is understandable uh, to the people of the other country. Uh, we also need to explain to our own people uh, in a plain language uh, why the other party makes uh, such and such arguments. We need to uh, use the language and the persuasion uh, which uh, would uh, encourage both parties to come to a, a negotiation ground. Uh, emotions are really important when we consider such a dispute. Uh, and uh, as it's often said by Professor Takashi Shiraishi, 
some Chinese people receive uh, Western education and some uh, respect uh, the values and sense of uh, values of uh, the Western style. Those what is called Anglo Chinese is the kind of audience we need to speak to uh, in order to indirectly influence a big country such as China. Uh, in a sense, this is a soft power approach. Uh, but in order uh, not to allow the other party to change the status quo so easily in a unilateral way, we need to use hard power. Uh, in other words, we have to utilize uh, Japan-U.S. Uh, alliance. Uh, and as was shown in uh, the Japan defense guideline, we need to uh, take into consideration the development of Japanese military powers. I have question to international uh, uh, law ex specialists. Um, uh, how uh, will international law uh, is developed uh, for the control and governance of cyber uh, conflicts? And the Mar uh, Japanese uh, Coast Guard uh, has uh, enjoyed expansion of budget uh, under the current administration. Uh, but 250 billion yen a budget, uh, that's the Japan Coast Guard and Tokyo University, uh, has more or less the same size of uh, annual budget. And with that, s such a small budget, they have to protect uh, 6,852 islands. And uh, Harvard University uh, is uh, more or less uh, uh, having the same level of a budget to organize uh, the university. So it's really a difficult job for Japan Coast Guard to protect the, all the islands with such a small budget. I'm Probably I have no answer for your question. But Thank you very much uh, uh, to the co for the comments uh, to, from uh, Professor uh, Agaba and Professor Amurata. I was uh, uh, very impressed with what you had to say. But regarding uh, the um, point about uh, uh, telling the Japanese, uh, the, that one's own uh, population about uh, the other country's uh, uh, feelings and mood. That is uh, not successful in my case. Um, uh, trying to talk about uh, what China's views are and China's thinking about, I still have difficulties doing that myself. So I would like to uh, tell you why that is difficult in responding to your question or comments. The reason why China is difficult, I believe, uh, comes in different levels. First of all, the so-called Anglo-Chinese may be a difficult case. China itself is so diversified multifaceted in nature, the government people, the intellectuals, and uh, the general population, uh, the foreign Chinese living overseas. I believe you can take them all as different people, uh, not the same Chinese. And uh, so uh, in, in, another, but in another way, perhaps uh, uh, China uh, needs to assert itself as being one China in order to keep these people together intact. So we are facing all sorts of different China, and the question is uh, how can a monolithic uh, Japan face a country like that? That's one. And uh, we have our own circumstances. The students here uh, in Japan uh, do not uh, read the Chinese character so well nowadays. So they are not able to read uh, Chinese uh, and the Chinese characters, uh, not being able to follow the mentality of the Chinese people. Of course, uh, I still have uh, my own problems as uh, not being able to read uh, so well and understand China well myself. But uh, given that situation, the question is, what can we learn? So not only the Japan Coast Guard, I hope that uh, we will be given a budget uh, for us uh, so that we can conduct our own studies and research uh, more fully. Thank you very much uh, for the comments and uh, thank you very much for your question. Now, of course, regarding the international law, uh, uh, we 
tend to be cautious uh, in uh, incorporating uh, the territories. Of course, uh, I believe uh, it is not always the case. Uh, international law, uh, it's only international law. That's a good way of putting it. But I think uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Reichler uh, also talked about the difficulties of understanding China. But I think uh, China is uh, fighting in law uh, uh, and uh, also uh, uh, working in the salami uh, strategy, changing the strategy little by little, changing the situation little by little to their advantage. Uh, they are fighting uh, with information as well, information war. And so um, I think it's an overall strategy when China tries to expand overseas. As uh, Professor Murata mentioned, so when they have power, they tend to expand. But when they don't have the power, uh, they would ten tend to be quiet and uh, try to uh, watch the timing. And therefore, when we fight in uh, legal terms, the question as to how we can be successful. As Professor Sakamoto mentioned, uh, international law is still ambiguous in many ways. And so China is trying to take advantage of these ambiguities. And uh, they come up with their own national laws uh, and they try to influence the international law uh, with their power. And so the question is, how can we come up with uh, an international law that can fight against uh, these uh, uh, unilateral measures? And also, when we think about the Chinese uh, history in the South China Sea, I think uh, it was immediately after the United States withdrew from the region uh, that uh, 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 they, the power vacuum was taken advantage of. And uh, it's in case of Senkaku, uh, in 2012, uh, China asserted uh, that it is uh, a, a core national interest of theirs, and therefore they will come eventually. And uh, uh, they uh, are looking at the uh, Kamchatka Peninsula or even going far as Los Angeles um, in their view of uh, coming up with maps uh, as to how far China can assert their territory. And therefore, uh, it's uh, really difficult for us to assess uh, what they're thinking about. But uh, such a, as against such a Japan, a Senkaku, if, if Senkaku is the most vulnerable and I, we have, I think uh, unless uh, we do have the Japan-U.S. alliance, uh, China uh, may not uh, venture such a move. But with Trump administration, we don't know what is going to happen. Um, or up till now, we we're not really sure about what the United States move will be uh, when China was to take the move. So. Uh, we just have to depend on the Japan-U.S. alliance, and uh, Japan, uh, I guess the Japanese government would have to rely on the United States uh, to help. And uh, there is, uh, regarding the, cy the starting rule, cyber um, is an area how, uh, as, where we are not able to, uh, uh, to uh, really pinpoint uh, the person uh, who is uh, making the attack. And so uh, when we think about uh, uh, the self uh, uh, defense is very difficult, and uh, not, it's, there is no strict rule as such. Uh, what regards what you said about the Japan Coast Guard? We need to. We would ask uh, uh, for various materials to be disclosed from the Japanese government, uh, but uh, not much has been disclosed so far. In 1952, uh, when the uh, patrol boat had uh, been uh, shot at uh, with uh, many bullet holes, uh, uh, they won't uh, show us uh, the uh, pictures. Uh, they, we, they wouldn't give us the details as to what has happened. 
So it's very difficult to get the information out of the Japanese government on these matters. Thank you very much uh, for the question and for your comment. Uh, as a, a special as a scholar of international law, I would not be able to add uh, so much. But regarding territorial matters, I would like to talk about a few things that I was not able to report on. Uh, regarding territorial disputes or in asserting territories, what is important, as I would see it, is one, effectiveness. Second, legitimacy. And uh, uh, unless you have the two of them, you will not be able to persuade uh, the other party or the international community. Unfortunately, international law, as I have said in my report, the sovereign country, sovereign state, uh, would only abide by uh, the uh, law uh, when it's in its national interest. And therefore, uh, for their own national benefit, uh, when uh, effectiveness uh, can uh, be uh, maintained, uh, then uh, they would be able to uh, keep the territory and uh, abide with the international law. But when unlawful means uh, are used to acquire territory, uh, that is not acceptable, and therefore legitimacy needs to be there. So effectiveness and legitimacy are two important points. But in addition to that, I would also say that uh, international law, a detailed uh, di uh, discussion is important, as, I, as Murata mentioned, but uh, we it can only discuss a narrow, limited area. Uh, we are always on a passive a stance um, as against the power balance. International law uh, is not something that uh, you can expect too much on, but uh, uh, in diplomatic nego negotiations, I think as a common language, uh, uh, you can make uh, quite good use of international law. And therefore, I think uh, uh, that is how you should use international law as a tool. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that I asked you to be quick, but now I'd like to let you into Mr. Reckler and Professor Sakamoto to give us a general comment. Uh, but I have one uh, request. Uh, my area of specialty is uh, modern China. Uh, uh, but we tend to be pessimistic when we consider and discuss uh, modern China. Uh, John Dunn uh, was uh, quoted uh, as a British poet. Uh, uh, by uh, Professor Takai. Uh, uh, on the part of pessimism, perhaps I can quote a poem from uh, William Brake, Born in uh, Endless Night. So that is a pessimistic feeling that seems to prevail in the field of modern China studies. So I would like you to give us some encouraging comments, Professor Sakamoto and Mr. Reckler, please. <laughs> Uh, well, I don't think it's easy for me to live up to your request and uh, expectation, but I'd like to make three points. Um, uh, Japan uh, is the only country which uses Chinese characters besides China proper, uh, but Professor Li Bi, um, a former director of Japan Research Institute of uh, China Academy said to me as follows, uh, person's way of thinking is uh, regulated not by letters but by grammar. Uh, English and Chinese grammars are very similar to each other. For Chinese people, American discussion is very easy to follow. But Japanese uh, argument uh, is understandable to a Chinese person only when they listen to the very end of the Japanese speech. Uh, but even after, at the end of the speech, they can never understand what the Japanese person was saying, he said. And uh, uh, we form an association of a study of international uh, law, and uh, we uh, already have held a joint workshop seven times with a Chinese uh, counterpart, um, a Chinese uh, young scholars, uh, for instance, Anglo-Chinese scholars, uh, 
Uh, in the field of international law dialogue, we do have a very sound relationship, but um, uh, the uh, current Chinese uh, government is uh, very um, uh, high-handed upon such studies. Uh, recently, a British uh, press uh, publisher um, uh, and we had an editorial meeting uh, We, because we and the Chinese colleagues were uh, planning to um, publish a, a book together, but um, uh, this publisher asked us not to make any mentioning reference to the uh, territorial dispute uh, between China and Japan. But actually, that was the request received through our colleague uh, in China. Uh, and this shows uh, the high-handed crackdown approach by the current Chinese government. Now, um, Chinese uh, construction of uh, patrol boats is much faster uh, than the construction of the same kind of boat uh, by Japan. Recently, in the areas around the Senkaku Islands, against China's offensive, uh, Japan is doing a one-on-one -on -one defense. But in the near future, such a one-boat-to-one-boat -one -boat defense will be very difficult to be successful. We have a lot of students here. So China is more or less slowing down in economic development. But as according to a book written by authors, including Professor Asano, um, after 2030, uh, China's GDP would be as big as American GDP. And by that time, although Japan was used to be called Japan as number one, uh, when Japan had 10% of the global GDP, but by 2030, uh, Japanese uh, GDP's uh, ratio to the world would be down to 5%. And this is circumstances the future prospects in East Asia vis-a-vis -vis, uh, ROK and vis-a-vis -vis PRC in such international relationship in this part of the world, how wisely can Japan behave? And international law in that regard is a very important tool uh, for Japan to consider our future course of actions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, my first comment is uh, that this was just a wonderful uh, presentation uh, by all three of you professors. Uh, I learned a tremendous amount, and uh, I am very grateful to all of you for your outstanding uh, presentations. Um, I um, greatly enjoyed uh, Professor Okamoto's um, historical analysis of China's approach to territorial sovereignty. Um, one thing that um, stood out to me, um, which uh, may have relevance to uh, Japanese-Chinese relations, was uh, the, the understanding um, in the early 19th and late 19th century that one of the tributaries was the Ryukyus. Um, I know Professor Asano has asked us for reasons to be optimistic. This might not uh, uh, comply with his request, but the concern that uh, I had, particularly as Professor Okamoto, I think very convincingly uh, displayed that some of uh, the Chinese government's uh, current attitudes toward territorial sovereignty uh, seem to be rooted in, in the past, in the effort to recover uh, the past uh, dominance or, or territorial expansion. So um, if uh, what Professor Okamoto said in his response to a question about, about um, and Professor Takai mentioned about the, the uh, China's focus on uh, the Senkaku, is, is that uh, a precursor to an even more uh, aggressive uh, 
uh, claim toward the Ryukyus. I, I, would, I would hope not, but it, it gave me some, at least, food for thought about that uh, potentiality. I, I think that's an important subject that you, you have raised. Uh, I, I also want to uh, uh, compliment Professor Takai and Professor Sakai for their really uh, excellent presentation on the controversies over uh, islands, particularly the controversies between uh, Japan and China, Japan and South Korea, uh, Japan and, and, and Russia. Um, I, I, I would like to, to offer this observation, uh, provoked by your uh, presentations, but also based in part on my experience in dealing with disputes over territorial sovereignty in, in different parts of the world, uh, as, a, as an advocate for, for one side or the other, but uh, developing a certain perspective. First, um, disputes over territorial sovereignty, whether they be continental or islands, are extremely, extremely difficult to resolve by negotiation. Um, there are many factors which make this difficult. But among them is the fact that if we focus on sovereignty, sovereignty is not a concept that is divisible, that can be shared. And it is either, uh, it's what we call a zero-sum game, win or lose. And this is very difficult for any government. Uh, even a government, even two governments, that in good faith are seeking a solution. A, a solution on a territorial dispute inevitably involves some compromise because state A is not going to accept everything state B demands, nor is state B going to accept everything state A demands. Even uh, uh, skilled and good faith negotiators who see a middle ground that is reasonable it's almost impossible to convince one's government and beyond the government, the, the population, to accept any surrender of any aspect of sovereignty. So these are enormously challenging disputes, no matter how valid Japan's claims may be. And you have made an absolutely convincing case, and you certainly have convinced me that Japan has a serious superior claims in all three instances, uh, Senkaku, Takushima, and the Northern Territories. But how do you get, uh, how do you make progress? Um, of course, one continues to develop the case, the facts and the law, and continues to press it. But is there, are there interim steps that can be taken to at least diffuse or minimize the conflict and uh, make an armed or military solution less, less likely. And uh, I, I, I draw some uh, thoughts from my experience in analyzing the situation of the islands in, in the South China Sea. Um, they are virtual, the, the Spratleys are claimed by several different states. Every, every one of the islands is claimed by China. Every one is claimed by Vietnam. About 30 of them are claimed by the Philippines. Malaysia also has some, some claims. Uh, the, uh, there is, in, uh, although it is preceded in fits and starts, there is an effort by the ASEAN group on the one hand and, and together with China to agree upon what they call a code of conduct. Now, they're, 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 the, the, the idea is that there would be no uh, effort militarily to take any islands that are not presently uh, uh, under one's control. So that uh, this, is an important, this is an important element. The code of conduct is still being negotiated. And it doesn't exist yet. 
But as we look at the history of that negotiation and what the states are trying to achieve, it seems to me that one element is some mutual understanding that neither state, none of the states involved, will seek a military solution. There may be other ways to diffuse or reduce tensions or uh, uh, reduce the possibility of military uh, uh, confrontation. Sovereignty, as I said, is indivisible. But sovereignty is, it conveys a certain, carries with it a certain number of attributes. For example, access to resources, whether in the island itself or in surrounding waters. And certain of these attributes are divisible. It is possible uh, to reach agreement, even as sovereignty is disputed, on uh, sharing the, the access to the fish, or even joint ventures in terms of drilling for oil or, or hydrocarbons. It may be possible for states to put aside, or put to one side, the sovereignty dispute o over the island itself, but still reach agreements on uh, access to resources. Another possibility is if the island is not inhabited, the states might agree not to put or establish civilian uh, settlements. They might even agree to make it an environmentally protected zone. Um, this is actually a concept that was put forward by Taiwan for, for the islands of, of the South China Sea. Um, another way of minimizing the um, tendency of the sovereignty dispute to uh, create wider problems is to agree on maritime delimitation without giving weight to these uh, small and uninhabited islands. For example, a median line in the East China Sea between China and Japan might be drawn based on equidistance but without giving effect one way or the other to the Senkakus. Um, in these ways, uh, it, it might be possible to reach agreements on certain of the aspects or the, the, the benefits, if you will, of sovereignty and therefore minimize or mitigate the importance of who is actually sovereign. Now that, that of course, uh, will, re will, will remain an active dispute, but perhaps if these uh, types of approaches are considered, the, 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 the possibility of, of, of confrontation uh, w w would be minimized. And uh, I, I thank you for um, causing me to think <laughs> about this. I hope my thoughts are interesting and, and lead, perhaps uh, cause you to think further about it, but uh, independently of what I've just said, I, I, I just learned a tremendous amount, and I, I'm really glad I got a chance to listen to all of you. It was, uh, I feel greatly enriched by uh, having, having heard your presentations, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Rector. Well, actually, it would have been proper if, uh, to give three uh, speakers to respond to the comments, uh, but uh, because of the time uh, uh, limits, we would like to open the floor for questions and comments. And uh, therefore, I would like to encourage the attendees to give questions, uh, raise comments to the speakers. Uh, one minute at the most to each person. Shorter the question is, the better. Or superior. Uh, some may have to leave very quickly, so I'd like to prioritize those who have to leave quickly. 
Professor Hiroshi Nakaichi, I had just an eye contact with you, so you are the first person. This is not a question, but rather a comment in my observation. Uh, Mr. Uh, Reichler, as uh, he said toward the end of the comments, uh, for international law or for international politics, the basic fundamental question is how to redefine a concept of sovereignty. Um, uh, Professor Okamoto, on the other hand, used the uh, notion of uh, uh, territorial sovereignty for China case. In the 20th century political science, uh, sovereignty wasn't defined clearly. It was uh, reduced into a concept which gives grounds to rights. Uh, of course, that's a very basic uh, a part of the concept of sovereignty, but I think uh, it's time for us to redefine uh, the notion of sovereignty. And, uh, well, British uh, Brexit, I think, is a very good example which demands us to consider the notion of sovereignty. Um, uh, the United Kingdom might have thought that they would be able to get back sovereignty, but now, in reality, it's so difficult for them to do that. So, in light of the present-day reality of the international politics, we need to consider and redefine sovereignty and what uh, can be uh, balanced vis-a-vis -vis sovereignty. Otherwise, it's going to be really difficult for the international community to come to any agreement. Um, and that's my comment. Uh, perhaps we should receive comments or questions from uh, the floor all at once uh, before asking panelists to respond, uh, Professor Sakamoto. Uh, thank you very much for very enlightening presentations. It's very clear cut, all of them. Uh, my uh, response uh, my comment is about uh, the international law on the offensive side uh, for a fighting uh, side. Um, it's important uh, that we claim uh, that that is our island, but on the other hand, um, from the international um, uh, law perspective, it is important to assert that that is not your island either, and especially um, uh, Northern Territories, uh, as um, in light of uh, the San Francisco Peace Treaty. Um, um, uh, it's, it's not that we abandon uh, the uh, sovereignty over the Kuril Islands. Um, we uh, 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 renounced the title to those islands um, from the sovereignty of Japan, but it's not that we g give them to Russia. Um, so uh, some uh, may argue for the absolute nature of sovereignty, but um, it's also important uh, that uh, we would continue to say that uh, this may not be our island, but that is not your island either. And I think that sort of um, uh, uh, argumentation is very important. San Francisco tri Peace Treaty in Article 2, uh, I support the Japanese government stance in this regard, and I think uh, Japan uh, can win the case uh, if that is brought to an international court, but actually the way Japanese government is arguing is against uh, the reality of uh, what really happened in history. Uh, so um, state, uh, history, identity, and sovereignty, uh, those are very interesting themes. Uh, any other questions or comments? A student. Thank you very much for the presentations. Uh, my name is uh, Shinka Ukon, a student of political science at the Faculty of uh, uh, Law of Doshisha University. Uh, I'd like to make some comments on the extension of the discussion on the issue of sovereignty. So how should I start? Uh, earlier, on the question in the history uh, to the development of notion of territorial sovereignty by Professor Okamoto. As Professor Okamoto said, uh, in China, uh, the concept of uh, territorial sovereignty was uh, born only a hundred years ago, a very short history indeed, but such a legal notion or concept like a sovereignty, I think, has 
a, a lot longer history. Uh, but in Asia, uh, uh, the notion of sovereignty has a short history. As a result, Japanese or Asian countries try to emphasize their interpretation of sovereignty, and because of the insufficient understanding of a sovereignty or international law, a bitterly interpretation of such a notion, I think, tends to take place in some Asian countries. Uh, I think we need to get the uh, questions or comments first from the floor, and later we'd like to turn to Professor Okamoto or other relevant speakers for response. Uh, one or two more questions or comments? Anyone with additional questions or comments? Please use the opportunity. Professor Okamoto, would you please respond then? Uh, Mr. Reichler, thank you very much uh, for your comments. I would like to talk about Ryukyu, Ryukyu, Okinawa. As for Senkaku, we have uh, had uh, presentations on Senkaku, so I think uh, we can leave it for that. But as for Okinawa, and uh, the Chinese view on Okinawa. This is uh, multi-layered, according to my interpretation. I think, uh, according to China, I think uh, they are one in saying that Okinawa does not belong to Japan. But uh, going a bit further, whether or not the China claims territory and uh, sovereignty of Okinawa, we are not really sure as to whether they will go that far. Now, I think uh, uh, this is related uh, to Fan Shu, countries dependent on China's suzerainty or hegemony, probably uh, China, uh, based on international law, is not able to claim sovereignty on Okinawa. But on a private level, who are interested in history, I think uh, it, shows on, it shows on the map. In other words, uh, uh, Fan Shu means that it's a part of their territory. So, domestically speaking, within China, in terms of governance, I think, vis-à-vis uh, -vis Japan or vis-à-vis -vis Okinawa, uh, they may have to come out being more offensive, and which is worrisome, because uh, they need to govern the country as one. So I think uh, China is not monolithic in, the, in their views. And vis-à-vis -vis Okinawa, I would say that some people say that their territory, some, but there are others who say it's not that it's not their territory. So I think Japan needs to understand these different levels of uh, Chinese views on Okinawa. Thank you. Thank you very much. We would uh, uh, like to spend uh, more time, uh, but the time is running, and therefore we would like to uh, close the panel discussion here. I would like to thank the panelists and uh, uh, the discussants uh, for their presentations and comments. Thank you very much. If I may just add one word. Professor Murata said over lunch that uh, this uh, is an era, area where Muromachi Bakufu, or the shogunate, uh, was uh, a government uh, was uh, located. Uh, it, we are uh, here at the cent the past the center of. Uh, uh, Japanese politics, and uh, the fact that uh, here we are holding this symposium on a government uh, territorial territory might uh, uh, end up uh, ultimately in the future where our names will be put on uh, um, metal plates uh, somewhere up in the uh, university to mark this event. So with that note, I will give up the microphone to the uh, moderator. Thank you very much. 
So uh, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Nakayama to give a closing remark. Uh, Professor Asano has already uh, wrapped up uh, the symposium, I would say, with uh, uh, witty remarks. But uh, although I do not uh, have uh, anything to add as an organizer, I would nevertheless like to give this closing remark. Thank you very much indeed uh, for your uh, attendance to the symposium in spite of uh, today being uh, uh, a Saturday. Uh, we have been very happy uh, to welcome uh, Mr. Reichler, uh, distinguished uh, practitioner in uh, arbitration. Uh, and also, uh, we have been grateful uh, to have heard uh, from uh, the distinguished speakers in the panel. And I believe this was a very fruitful meeting indeed. And uh, uh, the there was a mention about the Muromachi government. We are holding this type of symposium in Japan as well as elsewhere. And as for my personal view on the symposium, I was uh, very impressed by the fact that uh, we were able to have uh, such an interdisciplinary discussion and debate on this very important topic here in Kyoto. I believe it's a mag magnet uh, that the Kyoto has uh, to attract uh, uh, such uh, academic uh, scholars uh, to this uh, place. And uh, I personally was uh, very much impressed by the uh, breadth and depth of the discussion. Uh, JIIA would uh, like to continue uh, holding uh, this sort of uh, uh, forum. Uh, which allows uh, people to speak uh, freely uh, on uh, these type of subjects. And uh, personally, I hope uh, we could have another symposium here in Kyoto next year. As we have heard uh, from uh, panelists today, uh, in order to send out Japanese views uh, from Japan, to the outside world, we would need to uh, think uh, more seriously about how to uh, express ourselves uh, more widely uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, Mr. Reichler has pointed the, impo uh, the importance of this, and I hope that uh, JIIA would uh, be able to make a contribution uh, towards that end. I would like to thank uh, you all uh, for your participation. Thank you. With this, uh, we uh, end uh, our symposium. Thank you very much.